Uh, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, this is going to be a wonderful program, and we would expect nothing less for, uh, from the distinguished people uh, who are here as discussants and presenters and from the folks that have uh, organized it. So <clears throat> this program today comes to you under the auspices of our Center for Health, Science, and uh, Policy that uh, the director is Karen Porter, Professor Porter, who's in the back, uh, and she worries all these things to perfection and has been organized um, by our own Professor uh, Aaron Torsky. <clears throat> and on the other end, bracketing um, the stars, commentators, is our Professor Anita Bernstein. Uh, we're also very, very grateful to the support, financial support uh, and sponsorship of Aaron Fox. And let's give Aaron Fox a round of applause because thanks to their contribution, the CLA is free to you. Ooh, <clears throat> now, as you know, uh, I see our friend Professor Long coming down the stairs here. We were in Beijing last year uh, where she uh, offered, but this year I'm going to take her up on getting a tour of that wonderful uh, fi her fine university. <clears throat> on that campus, uh, I visited Schwarzman College, you know, which is the new $400 million facility that was built there by Steve Schwartzman for this new Schwarzman Scholarship Program. So Professor uh, Gerber and I walked in and felt very much at home, strangely comfortable, and we suddenly realized it looks just like this, except with a few pagodas, you know. And it was designed and built by Robert Stern, the same architect who built uh, the new wing of our building. So even in Beijing, we felt at home from Brooklyn Law School. The topic today is liability for um, <clears throat> the design of medical devices and pharmaceuticals. And um, there really is an all-star cast, including in the audience. Uh, so we have fabulous uh, scholars practitioners, um, policy experts, and I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful conversation. Um, and, and just forgive me just for a moment to, to I can't curb my enthusiasm that um, the real uh, supernovas of our world-class faculty will be participating. Professor Aaron Tversky, who is just remarkable, wonderful teacher, wonderful teacher, Fantastic scholar. Every time he spends 15 minutes in my office, which is frequently, but not never enough, I feel like I've deprived the world of an article. And he's just constantly dropping manuscripts. You all know the many. He's got more lifetime distinctions than Meryl Streep as we approach the uh, <laughs> Oscar Awards. And most recently, uh, we were so proud when he received the Prosser Award, which I know you all know about, given at the uh, a year ago already for at the American Association of Law Schools, and, and that is for lifetime achievement in the field of torts, of course, with the great, in the name of the great <clears throat> Prosser. And Professor Bernstein is one of the most insightful and original thinkers that I know, and a great asset to this law school in innumerable ways. And so you're going to see that I am not embellishing, as sometimes I've been accused of doing. Uh, in, in singing their praises. Um, so this program is fantastic. Again, our thanks go to the center and also to Aaron Fox. Um, and this program um, is also recognizing thanks to Aaron Fox and honoring the late Connie Raffa, class of 76. And she was a preeminent <coughs> healthcare lawyer um, at the firms and co-founder of the firm's healthcare practice. She spent about 40 years um, in, in practice and, and teaching and um, was perhaps most known for her interest and skill in palliative care issues and hospice communities. She spent a large part of her career starting out in the special prosecutors, uh, special narcotics prosecutor's office in New York uh, with uh, working alongside the Sterling Johnson, uh, Jr., class of 66. Also, my classmate, who's just a wonderful man, uh, Peter Kugazian, who's in that unit. And uh, that is really important service, especially given, you know, the uh, issues that we're addressing today with the opiate crisis. 
and uh, she also served in numerous capacities as a government lawyer, including the United States Department of Health and Human Services for 15 years, and she was a senior trial attorney and assisted regional counsel in the agency's Office of General Counsel. Uh, she came to Aaron Fox in 1995 and founded, as I said, the New York Healthcare Group advising uh, health agencies, hospices, physician groups, state healthcare associations, and palliative um, programs on legal matters. Um, I, I know that it due in significant part to her prominence and reputation that Aaron Fox's healthcare practice uh, is superb and highly regarded nationally and internationally. So I hope you all <clears throat> find that this is not only an interesting and enjoyable program, but a very worthwhile one, and that you begin to attack some of the cutting edge issues of our days. With that, I'll just say welcome. If you need anything in the law school, my office is downstairs at the ninth floor. The development office is on the ground floor. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you all. Have a wonderful program. Well, first of all, welcome from me and uh, my gratitude to the uh, panelists. <clears throat> uh, we could not want a more distinguished group of panelists than we have in here today. Um, <clears throat> My introduction of them will be um, short because their bi biographies are set forth at length in the information that you have. Um, I am cautioned by the people who run this uh, is that if you are seeking CLE credit, you have to sign in at the beginning and sign in at the end because partial credit is not going to be given. Mm -hmm. um, and they also request that you fill out evaluation forms um, before you leave. Having gotten <clears throat> um, those details out of the way, <clears throat> um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Paul Reingold. Um, Paul is a long time good friend. Uh, when we drafted um, uh, the uh, and we were reporters for the third restatement of products liability. Um, Paul was one of the advisors, <clears throat> um, and he well should have been. <laughs> there are a few plaintiff's attorneys who are as knowledgeable and, um, and both from the practical end and from the academic end. Um, if he were not a practicing lawyer, he clearly would have been a law professor. <laughs> um, Paul, with regard to um, uh, drug litigation, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say um, that he was the father of the field way back when. Um, and no one in, um, in the practice of um, law dealing with uh, drugs and medical devices has um, the kind of star-studded career that Paul Reingold has had. Um, um, he is the master at it, and it gives me great pleasure to present Paul to you. Thank you, Aaron. I gotta go back to my first slide here. Um, when I started, drug and device cases were no different than any other product case. If we had an auto or a machine that caused an injury, we had the same law. And now the, the field's been completely upended, and I'll be talking about some aspects of that, and you'll get more details later on. But the, the dirty P word, preemption, has uh, knocked down about 50% of the cases that we on the plaintiff side can handle. Um, so I thought I'd do is both, because I'm the starting speaker, give you a little introduction to just general what is design liability and products liability, tell you where we've been dinged on the plaintiff side and now what we're trying to do to overcome that. Um, of course, we have 50 states and 50 laws on what constitutes the potential liability of a manufacturer for a product that's badly designed. Now, it's different than badly manufactured or didn't, wasn't accompanied with proper warnings, but we're just talking about design, where every unit's the same thing, but every unit was bad in some respects. Not necessarily carelessness, because it's an aspect 
least in New York State, of strict liability. So I took the Voss case, which Aaron and I grew up on years ago, uh, where New York State brought strict liability for design defect into the law. And there's three requirements here, and almost every state has the same three requirements, of which number two is the, the problem, one and three is everyday situation. The first is the product's not reasonably safe in design. It's kind of a silly requirement because that's the outcome of what you're going to do on the whole test. And the third is easy. The design was a substantial factor in causing an injury. Of course, if it wasn't a proximate cause or a substantial cause, we wouldn't be involved. So what's inherently special about a strict liability design case, which might be for a bad drug or a bad um, the medical device, a hip or whatever we might be talking about, some implant, um, is that there was a feasible way to design the product to have avoided this risk or minimized the risk, design in a safer manner. And a lot of states, New York included, sometimes call this a risk benefit test, risk utility test. It's up to the jury to do some sort of weighing on the product uh, I could say, yeah, there would be a safer design for a gas tank in my car if I designed my car like a tank and put the gas tank in the middle. That's feasible, but on a risk benefit, the benefit's lost on that. In other words, there has to be a, a change I would make that would be uh, keep the costs at about the same range and provide, or provide greater safety. So if you want to think about that in the naive terms of um, uh, machinery before we look at drugs, uh, a case I recently had where um, a machine was a big machine with moving gears, it was a printing type of press, and it did have guards so the uh, person working in the press uh, would be protected, keep his arm away from the moving obvious risks. However, there was an, a speed adjustment which was a little hole down at the bottom and the worker could reach in and uh, change the speed on uh, which the press was moving. That wasn't guarded. So that's an obvious case of a claim that a plaintiff would make of the design defect liability uh, because the, our expert said a guard, which would have cost maybe $100, uh, just like the guard you had all over everywhere else in the machine, why don't you have it here? All right. So that's the, that's the simple days. But now we get to um, why today uh, drug and devices uh, differ. And if I can have a little uh, plaintiff's point of view at this point, almost all the law I'll be talking about today are 5-4 decisions of the Supreme Court, which if you had a slightly different judiciary, I wouldn't be talking about them. But the reality is we have the, um, these cases, three of the leading ones from the Supreme Court I've got up here. All right, now, on, um, on drugs, um, we have three types of drugs. If you think about the brand name drug, while it's still under patent control, the um, generic drug, which um, now has way over 50% of the market, and then we have drugs, the over-the-counter drug that you get if you have the flu or cold or something, and those are differently regulated, but those are all, quote, drugs, unquote, that the courts are going to have to deal with. The leading case... Um, on design liability from the Supreme Court is what we call the Bartlett case. You have a simple site there, which happened to involve a generic drug. <clears throat> and um, sometimes plaintiffs try and say, well, that was just for generics. It wasn't for brand names or over-the-counter. But um, you'll hear more later from other speakers that may not be a very important distinction. Uh, what happened in Bartlett was the plaintiffs had already lost in the Pleva case that I have cited there next. Oops, I uh, missed uh, 2010. I'm sorry, I missed the zero there. Um, in uh, Pleva, the Supreme Court said that generic drugs could not be um, sued for failure to have an adequate warning because in order to put a generic drug on the market under a long before enacted statute, uh, the was sameness. If you're going to put a generic drug out, it's got to be the same as the brand name drug that you're following. Well, the Supreme Court took that sameness literally and said the warnings have to be the same. So the generic manufacturer can't upgrade its warnings 
or isn't required to because it has to keep it the same as the manufacturer. And the manufacturer stops selling the drug, so it has no reason to upgrade its warnings. That's simply put for covering a lot of litigation. So then some plaintiffs thought, well, that's failure to warn. Let's claim a design defect. And the design defect in this generic drug in Bartlett that the plaintiff claimed was, was just too dangerous to be on the market. They should never have sold this. Um, whether you call it pre-market approval, post-market approval, um, just this drug causes this horrible Stevens Johnson syndrome, you should never have sold it. And the Supreme Court said, no, we already decided in PLEVA that, uh, that the sameness requirement applies. The, the, the brand name product had been on the market, you can put your product on the market, and there's no, the, the claim of a design defect is just an end run ploy over a failure to warn. So that was the end of generic design defects. Now, if you think about it, or if you go to some days before this law was created, we did in our practice claim that there were design defects in drugs. Not so much, not as often as you didn't warn about a stroke, but we said you could have prevented a stroke, let's say birth control pills, when they first came out, and I was involved in the litigation quite a while ago, they had about 10 times as much estrogen and progestin in them than they have now. Because they were being cautious, they didn't know, whatever. And it turns out you could have minuscule amounts and still achieve the same um, prevention of pregnancy. Well, with the increase of the progestin, you had the increase of thrombogenesis, clots, strokes, deaths, and so on. So there was a design defect you could argue, but of course you'll see uh, that's been circumscribed by Bartlett saying, well, you can't have a design defect for a generic drug, and that would leave us with a question I'm going to come to in a minute. Well, how about a brand name drug <clears throat> where you don't have any requirement of sameness? Now, the drug and device litigation, although in our minds it would seem like very similar products compared to autos or machines, whatever, saws, whatever people might get involved with, have completely diverged, so I'll be covering them separately hereafter. And what happened to us plaintiffs in the device cases, the, the uh, things that the FDA calls the device an IUD or, as I said, a hip implant or shoulder implant, was uh, no thanks. The Regal case came down from the Supreme Court, which didn't have to be decided this way, but was five to four. Supreme Court five majority in Regal said, you know, the FDA really looks over these devices very carefully. They do what's called pre-marketing um, analysis, PMA drugs. And, you know, if they approve the drug, we're not going to play in. This is a preemption situation. Uh, they've approved the drug. How can a court or uh, especially a humble jury possibly determine that there was some defect in, in, the, in the design or maybe in failure to warn on the product? Um, and there they do a distinction, again, between the type of products, and I won't go into in detail, but the FDA can approve a medical device in one of three ways. If it's a brand new concept and no one's had it before, it's the first time a defibrillator's come out or heart stent or something, they'll give it complete analysis. Well, of course, our discovery in cases shows the complete analysis is not very complete, but nonetheless, Supreme Court said it's complete, so it is. Then if you are the fifth person to want to put out a hip implant, which has already been approved, then you don't get a PMA or pre-marketing approval. You get a, a 510K approval, as you see the letters up there, which just refers to a section that says, we're going to look this over more quickly, this transvaginal mesh or whatever it might be, because after all, we had, um, we've approved the concept before. And then, of course, there's a class one device. Um, we have a new Band-Aid, and they don't why even look at it at all. All right, so now we've got Regal knocking out a major category of products, um, those that the FDA gave pre-marketing approval to. So now, um, I'm still in business, believe it or not, and a lot of plaintiff's lawyers, a few here in the audience I know, and, uh, around the country, we're still doing drug litigation, and you'll see in a minute device litigation, uh, but we have to um, be creative, and here we have, the Supreme Court hasn't weighed in yet, but I'm giving you some lower court cases. 
they're going both ways, and you'll hear some more about others of these later. I mean, we still could claim you should design this drug differently, but you think in terms of what constitutes a, a design for a drug, uh, primarily you'd think you, will, you could have different chemical components in it, or you could, as the example I gave you, less progestin in your birth control pills. Um, and the argument of the defendant always is, well, the government approved it the way it is, and where are you to come along and, and say otherwise? But so the plaintiff's arguments have come down in recent cases, like the Zeraltho case I'm going to cite, to, well, number one, um, while the FDA approved what you submitted, you could have submitted something different. And so we call that pre-approval argument. You should have uh, tested it, developed differently. You could have made a safer version of this product, lower amounts or whatever it might be. And therefore, uh, on that basis alone, um, we're going to claim that um, it's far from something that's preempted. When you see the word impossibility there in the middle of the slide, and a whole number of synonyms that, that courts have used for impossibility, um, obstacle, preemption, conflict, invention, uh, impossibility. What the cases or the defense attorneys are arguing is um, we, there's no way you can have a state court cause of action of Oz, New York uh, Supreme Court, this co uh, Court of Appeals decision um, allowing us to sue because it, the FDA would not allow it. So it's, it's impossible for us to comply with what you're claiming is state law and also deal with a regulatory body, the FDA. Um, and the, the impossibility defense or preemption has um, loomed strong in various states. Um, the best case for the defendant if, um, um, is the Yates case from the Sixth, Sixth Circuit, excuse me, which actually is decided under New York law. Uh, it completely accepted this defense. Yes, this drug company was preempted from doing anything different and doesn't uh, make any difference whether you argue pre-marketing approval, you should have done something different, or post-marketing approval when you found out how dangerous it was, you should stop selling it. Totally rejected any uh, cause of action based either on um, not market, stop marketing, or change it in any which way. So the H case, and there's a whole bunch of other cases like that, and uh, I might have to scratch around to find as many plaintiff's cases, but there are some. And the Zeralto case um, uh, from uh, Judge Fallon in Eastern District, Louisiana, is the case we plaintiffs like to cite. Um, Zeralto is a blood thinner, and there are now over 10,000 uh, suits pending in a multi-district litigation before the judge, and another three or 4,000 in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, claiming that, they're, um, that the drug is too dangerous as it was marketed uh, because what it, as a blood thinner, it thins your blood too, um, um, too, li too little, and you get a clot. And so I'm going to bleed, I'm sorry, bleed, excuse me, too much. And so people get an intracranial bleed and die, and my firm and other firms have hundreds and hundreds of these cases with that claim. So the Zeralto manufacturer says, wait a minute, this is just another uh, Bartlett preemption case. Uh, aren't you just telling us that, um, that you should have stopped marketing this dangerous drug or you should never market it to begin with? And the plaintiffs came up with a, a nice argument where you might have some facts that would fit that um, to help get around that problem. Uh, and as a result of their argument, the judge refused to dismiss the design case. One of the arguments was um, you, you sold this drug without a antidote. I mean, if you take too much Coumadin and you go to the hospital and are bleeding, they'll give you vitamin K. Well, there was no reversal agent or um, anecdote for someone who took Xeralto. And the defendant said, well, we warned about that, and the FDA approved the drug. And the plaintiffs argued, well, you should have held off marketing the drug. It's a bad design because you didn't have, uh, there was no device. And by the way, there still is no drug out there uh, to prevent you from... Uh, stop bleeding to allow you to stop bleeding. 
Um, so that's not a definitive case, and there's a few others where really the plaintiff won only in a sense that summary judgment or um, directed verdict was, it was denied, but um, it still had to be decided. So the Supreme Court, predictably someday, is going to now see whether uh, any of these arguments about you should have never sold it in the first place, that that's such a bad design, will they allow that to cause of action to um, exist? To go back to my simple days, um, let's say there was an automobile, new auto you could buy right here in the market, it's half the price of everything else, has no brakes. And you say, well, you know, um, if you warn me, there's a sign all over it, no brakes. Uh, but, you know, if you were driving that car and you had to stop and you couldn't, you killed someone, you know they're going to claim the car was defectively designed without brakes. Well, same here. There are arguments throughout, though. It was designed without a reversal agent uh, or an antidote. Um, but, of course, we're tied up in preemption, as you're going to hear all morning. Then the plaintiffs like to cite finally under trying to end run around drugs, the uh, Lance versus Wyeth, where the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania um, decided to design uh, defect claims in drugs. This is against Wyeth for the drug fenfen, uh, fenfluramine, uh, was allowed to proceed. And um, I don't, others of you on the panel may be talking about Lance. I've tried to read it two or three times, especially yesterday. I just I like the result, but I don't know if you want to tease your brain, try and reach the decision. Okay, now I'm getting down to the end of the talk. Uh, maybe we found some way to end run drug cases, not, not the, the uh, generic ones so much, but over-the-counter ones or, um, or uh, brand name ones that just come out in the market like Xeralto. On devices, we have a much tougher situation. It was always tough to begin with to show a, a, a medical device had a bad design. It was usually more likely you failed to warn about this or that, you know, and tell the doctors certain types of patients shouldn't get the drugs, whatever it might be. Uh, so in a PMA case, which have the, the uh, pre-marketing approval case, um, whenever we try and claim, well, the design is bad, the defense is, uh, we showed the FDA it had this stent, it had this wire mesh. Yeah, it's true now, we see it's causing injury, but the FDA approved it, so that's that. So I, it's hard for me to think of a design defect case we might win on a PMA type of product. But most of the devices that come out are Me Too type devices with maybe some enough changes to get around someone else's patent. And so those are the 510K cases, and those are still there, the transvaginal mesh cases, I don't know if you're aware of that multi-district litigation, there's 125,000 women suing for injuries from these uh, slings and meshes that were, uh, were put in. Those are all 510K, so there's no block to bring suits like that. And if we are in New York State now, you'd come forward with a Voss analysis. Um, uh, this was uh, not reasonably safe. There was a way to make the mesh that was safe which we've shown that there were safer plastic uh, devices to use. Um, and, but then, of course, the defendant's going to come back with the, the restatement area, which I'm not covering because that's coming up, and that as well, all drugs and devices are unavoidably unsafe. So that's a defense anyways, aside from any preemption. It's a, a restatement, second, third analysis that you have to take into consideration. So um, while I might have preferred last, coming last and trying to answer all these other people, um, I did get to go first, so I've given you the basic law and the um, attempts we're making. We're not going to give up on the plaintiff's side to represent you, if I could consider you consumers of drugs and devices, uh, but it's getting harder by the year, courtesy of the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Professor Mark Geistfeld. He is the Sheila Lubetsky Birnbaum Professor of Civil Litigation at New York University the School of Law. Uh, he is a prolific, prolific scholar um, and a, a creative thinker um, and 
across the, not only in, in product liability, but across the field of torts. Um, <clears throat> when, whenever you, you run across a Geistfeld uh, article, um, <clears throat> you know that you're going to have to sit down and work it through and think it through. Uh, <clears throat> he is, um, <clears throat> he is a, a, a seminal thinker in the field. And it gives me great pleasure to ask um, Mark to talk about recovering the rationale for comment K. Such a generous introduction, thank you. Um, comment K, I'm going to be talking about the common law uh, rules governing defective product, uh, defective drug design. Uh, under the restatement second largely, and uh, Nita, the following speaker, will do it under the, uh, the common law rules under the restatement third. Um, so we'll, we're, I won't be talking about preemption, uh, but how uh, outside of uh, the federal regulatory scheme and so on, a claim of defective drug design would go. Um, now the, the whole uh, field here is completely warped. Uh, by comment K in section 402A, the rule of strict products liability that uh, is uh, been widely adopted across the country. And when courts adopt 402A, they, it's, they almost treat it like a statute. They literally adopt it and they try to parse the uh, language of the commentary and so on. So it's an interesting uh, component of the product law to see uh, the common law developing from a common textual source. Uh, now, the text of comic K itself, as is widely uh, acknowledged, uh, is really hard to understand. Um, and the difficulty of interpreting uh, comic K has led uh, to mistakes uh, that have been argued by others. Uh, but it's not because comic K is unintelligible um, and the logic or the apparent lack of logic of comic K is something I'll discuss briefly. Uh, the difficulty uh, with the way that comic K has been interpreted in my view is that actually it doesn't have uh, much to do, if at all, with the uh, design of drugs uh, and the like. Uh, that comic K properly understood actually is much more relevant to the issue of something like if an autonomous vehicle crashes because it's been hacked into by a third party, is that a product malfunction subject to strict liability? Um, and I've written about that issue at length in a recent article in the California Law Review. I am going to make the same basic argument here. Uh, the relevance of all this to drug design is that if you properly understand comment K, you can see that it is being misapplied. Uh, it's one argument to say comment K makes no sense, let's get rid of it. Uh, that's not the argument I'm making here. Comment K makes a great deal of sense, uh, but once you understand it properly, you can then see why it's not relevant to uh, drug design and why it ought to be relocated elsewhere. So I think the interpretation of comment K has had two bad effects. It's messed up drug design litigation, and it has also uh, left uh, courts unable to properly apply common K in areas where it uh, belongs. Um, so common K, the language itself, and again, courts treat this textually, so we can do the same here. There are some products which, in the present state of human knowledge, are quite incapable of being made safe for their intended and ordinary use. These are especially common in the field of drugs. An, extending, an extend, outstanding example is the vaccine for the Pasteur treatment of rabies. Commonly causes nasty side effects. Here's the key language. Such a product, properly prepared and accompanied by proper directions and warnings, is not defective, nor is it unreasonably dangerous. So an unavoidably unsafe product under this language here, uh, if properly prepared and accompanied by proper direction and warnings, is not defective, unreasonably dangerous, subject to strict products liability. Well, what does that language mean? Um, it would seem to mean that if you've got, uh, you're talking about drugs, uh, vaccines, and so on, the literally expressly referenced in the comment here, it would seem to be that if there's an unavoidable side effect, that is caused by a drug that uh, has been properly prepared and is accompanied by an adequate warning, then it's not defective as a matter of the consumer expectations test. It's not unreasonably dangerous, to use the language of 402A. Unreasonable danger in 402A is the consumer expectations test. So it doesn't violate the consumer expectations test and it's not, as a result, subject to strict liability. 
All right, so then if that, that seems to be the pretty straightforward uh, meaning of this, uh, and from then it would follow that, okay, well, we've taken out proper preparation, which is manufacturing, construction defects, and so on. We've taken out the issue of warning because the comment assumes that the uh, product has been accompanied by a warning. Therefore, we're left with issues of design. Uh, so the comment would seem to be on its face directed toward the problem of the inherent risk of drug designs. Um, and so that if uh, we're talking about injuries caused by the inherent risk of a drug design, uh, then it's not subject to strict liability under 402A. Uh, that all seems to be pretty straightforward. Um, and that's how, of course, courts have widely interpreted it. So what that would mean then, uh, under this interpretation, and this is the majority rule, the courts are all, uh, there's a variety of rules that have actually been adopted by courts here, but this would then straightforwardly lead to the majority rule that if a plaintiff comes into a case and says the drug violates consumer expectations uh, because of an inherent risk of side effect, that the manufacturer as a defense can show that in fact the drug is unavoidably unsafe. And to do so, the manufacturer has to show that the drug passes the so-called risk utility test. Um, because then, if it passes the risk utility test, it's inherent in the drug. If it's inherent in the drug and there's a proper warning and it's properly prepared, there is no strict liability. And so the manufacturer can, therefore, assert a defense against a claim of defective design by reliance on comment K. So comment K, in the majority approach, serves as a defense to uh, preclude application of strict liability. Seems to all straightforwardly follow from the text of comment K. Um, but then once you work with that rule, it's been widely recognized, it's actually quite puzzling uh, when you compare drugs to ordinary products like the machines Paul was talking about. Um, because of course in the ordinary product case, take the California rule for example, which nicely illustrates, it's a, this approach is I think the majority approach in the country, you've got the consumer expectations test that's conjoined with the risk utility test. When are the, when the, uh, if the consumer uh, is alleging uh, consumer expectations as the basis for liability, risk utility is not a defense. And so notice then how comment K would seem to fill in that gap. Uh, but for uh, ordinary cases uh, in which the consumer says the uh, design in question violates the risk utility test, the plaintiff has the burden of proof here. The manufacturer doesn't have the burden of proving that the product passes the uh, risk utility test, except for a few jurisdictions like California. So if we're talking about an ordinary machine, the consumer has the burden, if the product uh, uh, passes consumer expectations, the consumer has the burden of showing uh, that the product fails the risk utility test. Comment K, uh, rather, which is supposed to be a defense to strict liability, somehow places the burden on the manufacturer instead. How can this be a defense that somehow benefits the manufacturer if it places the burden of proof on the manufacturer? There are any number of other puzzles about comment K that you can draw out from the way that it's written and applied by the majority of courts. And so as uh, Aaron and Jim, uh, for example, in their articles say, look, you know, this is the, the case law here is gibberish. Uh, we can't restate gibberish. And so we're going to adopt an entirely different provision, Section 6C of the Restatement Third that Anita will be discussing. All right, so that the seemingly straightforward interpretation of comment K does lead to a well-defined rule, but the rule makes no sense. 6C tries to solve that problem, but the majority of courts today still re rely on the same basic framework that I'm uh, laying out here. Um, and so there's this puzzle about uh, the common law of uh, liability for defective drug design. Right? And as I said, this, is, I, this I think is just a completely mistaken interpretation of what comic K is all about. And by the, the two basic moves uh, that I need to make here in order to clarify what comic K is about are actually both set out in articles that were written for the Brooklyn Law Review uh, uh, based on a conference here uh, a few years back, a symposium on the restatement third, last time I spoke in this room. Um, so one article by Mike Green, uh, Talking about the history of 402A, says, you know, when you look, when you have to, when you put 402A in historical context and you think about what's the case law 
that uh, is being restated at that point in time? What's the safety problem uh, that is being addressed there? Uh, it, the, the problem basically is what we would call today malfunctioning products exploding Coke bottles, contaminated food, uh, all products that violate the implied warranty of fitness for intended purpose. Uh, common M of 402A says, look, the bottom line is the rule here is effectively the implied warranty, the tort version, not the contract version. Uh, if you want to call it that, as they do in Massachusetts, for example, that's perfectly fine. Understand, however, that it's tort, not contract. Uh, all right, now when you have that mindset then, if 402A is about a uh, rule of strict liability for malfunctioning products, and Mike makes that argument nicely in the article there, and I fully agree with his interpretation of 402A in this respect, think about what comment K means in that context. Um, so what comment K is referring to in this context, and we'll use the uh, rabies, uh, the Pasteur rabies vaccine as the example, because after all, it's the illustration provided by comment K. So the initial formulation of that vaccine uses an attenuated virus at that point, initially from rabbits. Um, uh, one of the incidents, side effects, from that vaccine is, and this is true of most, I don't know if all, but it's true of most attenuated vaccines, it has the potential side effect of causing rabies. Okay, so now, is that a malfunction or not? Uh, now, the concept of malfunction is surprisingly undeveloped within product liability. The rule seems to be we know it when we see it, the exploding bottle of Coke or whatever. A vaccine that is supposed to, it has the manifestly intended purpose of protecting you from rabies causes you to suffer rabies. Is that a malfunction? Language of the restatement third frustrates its manifestly intended purpose. Under that language, why isn't this a defect under section three of the restatement third, to use the language of the restatement second? Why isn't this a malfunction? Why doesn't it violate consumer expectations of ordinary product performance? It's not at all clear. There are cases, there's a case from Nevada 10 years or so ago involved in the polio uh, vaccine, same outcome. You took the uh, vaccine to pr protect yourself from polio when you get polio as a side effect. Isn't that a self-defeating type of product performance that renders the product defective and subject to strict liability? All right, now the, the vaccines and drugs more generally, of course, don't necessarily have limited side effects of this type. Uh, you can broaden the analysis to see how actually there's a potentially pervasive problem with the rule of strict liability. The whole class of drugs for health that, that promote health and safety, drugs of course, medical devices are classic examples, but not the only examples of this. Uh, any product with the intended purpose of promoting health and safety that causes injury is arguably self-defeating in its performance. And again, of course, the uh, rabies vaccine nicely illustrates this, as do all of the kind of uh, drugs and so on that the comic case seems to be alluding to. More generally, uh, there's a body of uh, literature uh, by psychologists showing, you know, uh, consumers in cases like this feel betrayed. There's a promise of safety and you end up being harmed. And so you feel like you have been betrayed in this basic sense. You can see there's a mismatch, potential mismatch between expectations and performance here that can lead to a conclusion that there's a frustration of consumer expectations. It renders the product effective, subject to strict liability. All right, now think about what common K means when you understand it with, or interpret it within the framework of malfunctions. The consumer claims that a malfunctioning product violates consumer expectations. The, that's how the, these cases proceed under the comment law. The plaintiff alleges the drug violates consumer expectations. All right, now ordinarily in the case of an exploding Coke bottle, any type of malfunction, an allegation of uh, the violation of consumer expectations of this type forecloses a defense based on the risk utility test. Coca-Cola doesn't get to avoid liability for the exploding Coke bottle simply because uh, the design passes the risk utility test, its quality control measures are reasonably safe or whatever. Those are all negligence defenses. This is a rule of strict liability. So ordinarily, the allegation of the product violates consumer expectations, 
permits no defense based on risk utility. If we understand the materialization of a side effect in drugs or medical devices, the impairment of bodily integrity, bad injuries, bad health outcomes as frustrating consumer expectations or potentially frustrating consumer expectations, because again, the concept is vague, you can understand the logic of comment K. Comment K says, no, in these instances, this is not, we're not going to treat this as a malfunction. We're not going to treat it as a violation of consumer expectations. We will permit the manufacturer to defend by showing that the drug is unavoidably unsafe in this respect. And to do so, the manufacturer, of course, is going to have to show that the risks in question were unavoidable. In other words, they couldn't have been redesigned out of the product. All right, to illustrate the point here, uh, blood, contaminated blood. Roger Trainer from the California Supreme Court, one of the founders of strict products liability. He says blood, contaminated blood, is one of the paradigmatic examples of an unsafe product under comment K. How could that be? Pretty straightforward under the uh, logic that we're using here. All right, so contaminated bud, blood in modern parlance would be a manufacturing defect. Uh, HIV virus in the blood departs from the specifications of pure blood. Um, in the same way that contaminated food departs from the specifications of pure food, it's clearly defective, subject to strict liability with no defense available along risk utility, reasonableness lines, or whatever. So contaminated blood, if subject to ordinary rule of strict products liability, would be unreasonably dangerous, it would violate consumer expectations, it would subject the manufacturer to strict liability. You cannot warn your way out of liability for that in the same way you can't warn your way out of liability for exploding Coke bottles. Can't use any kind of reasonableness defense to avoid liability. You, the manufacturer, are subject to strict liability. Why is that so bad? What's the difference between contaminated blood and exploding Coke bottles? Massive difference. Uh, so when the HIV virus first gets introduced into the bloodstream in the 1980s, there were a few years of course, before we were aware of it, before tests were available, even when tests became initially available, they're not completely perfect at screening out the virus. So even the exercise of reasonable care means there will be HIV antibodies and uh, the virus uh, in uh, blood. Um, so hemophiliacs just get decimated by this disease uh, and because they're taking concentrated blood products and so on, class action by hemophiliacs against the blood industry. Uh, as uh, Judge Posner pointed out in tossing the claim out on class action grounds, it's an interesting case for uh, class action purposes, but for here he says, look, you know, the problem is uh, that liability in this case would hurl the blood industry into bankruptcy. And not only the blood industry, basically a huge chunk of the international pharmaceutical industry. So what, you know, so you've got a life-saving product, literally a life-saving product, blood. Nothing done wrong on the part of the manufacturers. It is a manufacturing defect. It malfunctions, to use the uh, modern language today. Absent the protection under comment K, blood manufacturers will be subject to strict liability. Subject to strict liability for massive systemic risks that they cannot control by the exercise of reasonable care. Liability of that sort is going to threaten the stability of an industry that promotes health and safety. So what have we done here? A rule of strict liability that's supposed to promote product safety has a self-defeating outcome of actually undermining safety across the market. Obviously a bad outcome. Of course there should be a defense in those cases, and that's what Common K does. Early case law on contaminated blood went along these lines. Had those cases been able to develop within the common law, I think we would have the uh, interpretation of common K that I'm now talking about. What happened instead is that state legislatures stepped in and realized that strict liability is crazy in these circumstances, and they widely enacted blood shield statutes. The blood shield statutes treat blood as a service rather than a product. Therefore, not subject to strict products liability. Uh, it's just a service subject to ordinary negligence. Restatement third, restating the law properly in this respect does the same. Uh, but what happens then is that comment K 
the apparent logic of it, which is so clear in the contaminated blood cases, as Trainer rightly pointed out, it's too bad he didn't fully articulate why he thinks that he thought it was the paradigmatic example of an unavoidably unsafe product. But if he had, uh, the uh, logic would be much more clear today. But that case law never really developed. Um, another interesting example, is, as uh, Aaron and Jim in their article briefly uh, point out to, is the early cases under comment K oftentimes dealt with uh, failure to warn for unforeseeable risks. All right, now what's that about? Think about it within the same context. So the, uh, an unforeseeable risk. The manufacturer can't warn about it. By definition, it's unforeseeable. If you don't know or shouldn't know about it, you can't warn about it. Uh, so there's no way you can address this by way of a warning. So too, from the consumer's expectation, the materialization of an unforeseeable risk is necessarily gonna frustrate your expectations. I had no idea the risk was there. I'm now injured by it, my expectations are frustrated. Malfunction, Wisconsin case, uh, the, the latex glove case, green, uh, reached the same result not that long ago. Um, the logic of strict liability here is pretty straightforward. Think about unforeseeable risks for drugs and so on. Uh, the risks that couldn't have been uh, identified at the time when the drug first went on to market. You've got, yes, you've got extensive pre-market testing and so on, but it's a very limited population uh, of uh, page, uh, consumers who are taking the drug. It's not until it's widely distributed that you're gonna pick up on low-level risks and so on. Uh, that ought to be warned about, perhaps ought to be uh, affect whether the drug should be marketed at all and so on. Uh, but at the initial time of sale, these are unforeseeable risks you would expose drug manufacturers to liability for unforeseeable risks, it would violate consumer expectations, be subject to strict liability. Again, that kind of liability for unforeseeable risks totally threatens the stability of a market that, after all, is about promoting public health and safety. So, of course, if our public policy of products liability is about promoting product safety, then if strict liability has the self-defeating effect of actually disrupting markets for safety, then there ought to be a defense to strict liability. That's what comment K properly interpreted does. That's not what the current application of comment K in drug design litigation does at all. Uh, it's a misdirection. Uh, and that misdirection has led to these skewed rules about defective design liability, but it also means when I made the argument, oh, comment K is potentially applicable to a safe enhancing product like autonomous vehicles that promise to substantially reduce the carnage on our roadways. Uh, there is a chance that we're going to have a systemic risk like we had in the contaminated blood context. The systemic risk here is going to be hacked vehicles. A hacked vehicle is going to frustrate consumer expectations. You expect the vehicle to be operated by the operating system itself, not by an unauthorized third party. You can see how it easily falls into the category of a malfunction that frustrates consumer expectations to the extent that risk can't be controlled. It's an empirical question. I don't have a position on that because none of us have the data. But to the extent it is systemic, widespread, and can't be controlled by reasonable care, you threaten the, the financial viability of a product uh, that has the promise to substantially Make the, to make the world a substantially safer place. And that's obviously bad. So comma K would be great there. But everybody says, what are you talking about? Comma K is about drugs, vaccines, or whatever. It would have nothing to do with something like an autonomous vehicle. All right, so comma K, it's, it's, it's not gibberish. An argument that says it's gibberish is then runs into the difficulty of, of telling the majority of courts across the country, why are you so stupid as to have adopted gibberish? Um, the difficulty here, again, is that it has logic to it, but that logic was stunted uh, early on. The blood cases would have brought it out. And instead, because of the apparent uh, uh, meaning of the language, as I laid it out in the beginning, looks like it straightforwardly leads to the rule that the majority of courts have adopted across the country, understood in historical context, interpreted in the frame of malfunctioning products, there's logic to comment K that I hope to have somewhat recovered this morning. Thanks. <laughs> I guess.
guess I have a, a question uh, for Mark, I, I, with the appreciation for um, Paul's fascinating insights into current um, plaintiff practice. I have only a shallow command of your California Law Review article on um, autonomous vehicles, but I'm kind of um, wondering about uh, whether you're saying that comment K uh, applies to harms that, that they may uh, occasion, uh, because comment K has a reference to warning, which I think would be beside the point in the case of hacking where some third party gets injured. So, yeah, so in the same, one of the difficulties, major difficulties with comment K is it references a proper warning, it also references properly prepared, although later in the comment it says even sometimes products can't be properly prepared. So that's what makes everybody uh, also believe that it's simply about defective design. Um, the, the, the problem with warning uh, when you're talking about malfunctions is illustrated by the exploding bottle of Coke. You can't warn your way. You can't say warning, Coca-Cola bottle might explode and that's going to uh, prevent the manufacturer from being liable. So when you're talking about malfunctions, there are important cases in which you can actually warn your way out of a malfunction and the kind of patent danger rule at the common law fully illustrates this. When the, when the risk inheres in every product, uh, and that of course is uh, the, the area of inherent risk in design, then you can warn your way out of it. Um, but the risks posed by hacking actually are an intermediate area, so I, if, if it were left to litigation in the courts, I can see some courts saying, yeah, you can warn your way out of it, as your intuition suggests, um, but I can easily see other courts saying, no, the warning isn't going to be efficacious here for the same reasons it's not with respect to the exploding Coke bottle. So it's clearly it's open question, but I, I can easily see a split across the country. I have a question. So um, this is a pretty basic question, but it was, it was intriguing in the beginning the way you analytically separated out the consumer expectations test being strict liability and comment K providing for a defense based on risk utility. So um, an obvious sort of um, response I think sort of inspiring, or in part inspiring the third restatement approach is to say consumer expectations makes no sense in a variety of realms, but particularly drugs and medical devices. Right, so here the other article from the Brooklyn Law Review Symposium that I didn't reference in my talk that I meant to is the one by Aaron and Jim as their, their reading of the case law across the country, again, accords with my own. When courts invoke consumer expectations to this day, and the majority rule is of the type you see in California, that you have consumer expectations coupled with the risk utility test. As a California court puts it, um, you know, the fact that a product passes consumer expectations just means it performed in a minimally acceptable way and it may be defective under the more demanding risk utility test. As Jim and Aaron found in their article uh, by looking at it, when courts reference uh, consumer expectations as a standalone test, they are almost, the vast majority of cases are using it in the race ipsa like situations of product malfunction, right? So if the allegation is one of product malfunction, which is recognized under the restatement third, uh, you can easily frame it as consumer expectations. And again, the historical context of 402A is exactly that type of problem. Um, it makes a great deal of sense. It's not just gibberish. Uh, it, is a, it is a viable form of liability that's independent of the risk utility test. Um, and so that's how I, that's the invocation of consumer expectations that I'm using. I think that's really the majority approach. I mean, the criticisms about the restatement third, does it get design defect liability, right? Consumer expectations against risk utility. If you just understand consumer expectations as being ordinarily a, uh, a marker for malfunctioning products, an allegation of uh, malfunction, and then you can see, of course, uh, the two tests can exist side by side. And the fact that a product doesn't malfunction doesn't imply that it's not nevertheless defective under the risk utility test. So there's a whole logic to these liability rules. I think it's fully consistent with what the restatement third does. I think it'd be a lot better if the restatement third had framed all of its rules in terms of consumer expectations, because I think that's what products liability is all about at the end of the day. So I'm going to resist you normatively and descriptively that, that there is I no there there. as much. <laughs> no there, Just there giving you an opportunity. <laughs> Let me say that um, the, one of the biggest bugaboos we had in, in drafting um, the restatement in section, in section three, the residence section, was whether or not 
to frame it in terms of consumer expectations. <clears throat> and the reason that we didn't do it is because a freestanding consumer expectation test is <clears throat> It's almost endless. The question is, how do you limit it? And that's why we put it in the context of res ipsa, which has a long history, rather than the context of consumer expectations. Um, you know, I wonder right now if I were redoing it, and um, don't you know, <laughs> don't quote me, uh, but if I were redoing it, whether or not um, I w would think of of finding a way of um, of coupling the uh, uh, section three with consumer expectations, but saying, but damn it, please don't, you know, yes. it, it, don't apply it all the way up because if not, all the product liability law becomes con con consumer expectations. <clears throat> I mean, uh, if you take the, the Campbell case in California uh, with the, um, uh, where somebody, uh, a bus was made a, um, a, a turn and the, um, a sharp turn and the plaintiff fell and the court said, well, that's in the common consumer expectation test because there, was, there wasn't a, a pole there for him to hold on. I'm not sure that that is a consumer yeah, expectation because it, yeah, you can put poles all over the place in, in, in a bus, and, be, and, and it, it can be it can be dangerous. Um, so, what happens when the consumer expectation test is at war with, with risk utility? Um, you know, I think risk utility has to win. Be that as it may, I mean, it it was one of the real problems that we had, and um, and I'm not sure that we didn't do the right thing, although. I, 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 maybe if we were doing it again, I, we would find a way of, of saying, yes, there is a consumer expectation test, but, be, but beware, it, it, it doesn't eat up all the product liability law. Right. Uh, the other thing, and I have had some research assistants working on this, is even the states that are pure consumer expectations cases um, are, are <clears throat> The vast majority are the cases where, where, in fact, in the case, plain food, reasonable alternative design. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, that's just empirically, that's right. empirically too. I, I think I once heard Paul say uh, that he would no longer go, go into a design case uh, without a reasonable alternative design after he would walk in with his undershirt. Uh, <laughs> Still uh, true. And, and, uh, well, you know, you, you got to tell a jury something. You got to tell a story, right. and the story has got to be that there was a better way to make it. Yeah. <clears throat> now, with regard, one other remark with regard to um, to um, comment K. Um, is it, well, strict liability won't apply. I mean, at least the way that the courts are dealing with it, strict liability won't apply. Well, the answer is that that. that that the negligence won't apply also to a pure design case in, dr in drugs. Not that strict liability won't apply, negligence won't apply either. So it's, not, it, it's the question of whether or not there's going to be risk utility. Yeah, I, I don't get that out of comic K. Comic K, you know, the, it just, it just uh, says strict liability doesn't apply. Negligence is the default rule of tort law. You know, it could say, yeah, of but, course, but, there's no but, tort but, law. If, but, well, but if if we're right in Section 6C, um, then then garden variety negligence does not work because you don't have a reasonable alternative design. Yeah, no, I you know, but but that is uh, your what you're doing in 6C is a particular type of risk utility negligence inquiry. So you're not saying there isn't any. You're just constraining it in a way that I gather Anita is going to discuss that length shortly, but it is still, you're not saying there is no liability at all, and I don't, I, comment K on its terms, I think if you'd said that to the, to the reporters back then, that comment K means there's no tort liability flat stop, I think they would strongly disagree with that. Um, it, there is, it's just not going to be a rule of strict liability, um, and there was a robust body of negligence law governing designs back then, that's in a separate section, that comes out of a separate section, and the restatement second. So I, I don't get any kind of, you know, idea that somehow Comet K was intended to just knock out everything else. Um, I think it's time um, um, for a break. Uh, <clears throat> our next speaker is Professor Nina Bernstein, a member of our faculty. Um, <clears throat> 
if you look at her bi bi biography, you'll see that she has published in every major law review that one can think of. Um, she has written numerous books. Uh, <clears throat> she's almost a Renaissance scholar because the breadth of her um, interests is enormous. Um, but she has had, always had a very deep interest in products liability. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we talked shop from time to time. Um, it's my pleasure to give you uh, Anita Bernstein. Oh, uh, thank you, Aaron, for that uh, very kind introduction. I say thank you advisedly because, uh, as you're about to hear, uh, I am about to appear ungrateful for your many years of, of mentoring um, and leadership in, in the uh, area of products liability. I will try to make a case against um, the very creative, innovative, uh, and insightful reform uh, that Aaron and his co-reporter Jim Henderson introduced uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, in suggesting. A, a this screen seems a little misfitting. Uh, that the um, restatement uh, uh, section uh, 60 uh, design defect test uh, may fail risk utility. I have a kind of uh, layout for the the talk that I'll uh, put out here. First, I'll briefly uh, say what the um, section uh, uh, 60 test provides. Note my appreciation. Then the longest part of the talk, the downsides. Uh, one upside, uh, and then if I have time, I'll, I'll talk as fast as I can. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, consider um, an alternative. Uh, so what, what the uh, test uh, that this um, innovative section uh, uh, says um, is uh, that a product, uh, drug, or medical device is not reasonably safe due to defective design if the foreseeable risks and so on, you know, it's up there in front of you are too great. Uh, and the important part of the, uh, the, uh, the test, the, the contribution that the reporters make, uh, is that the uh, drug is or design or a medical device is defective if uh, a, an informed provider would not prescribe it uh, to any class of patients. I, I want to suggest a, a risk utility perspective uh, on this um, idea for a test uh, for design defect. Uh, we know that uh, it's the nature of a drug to be poisonous um, and unsafe just by uh, its existence. Uh, the uh, goal of products liability law should be to maximize uh, the benefits of this product and minimize uh, their downsides. Uh, we have, uh, unlike um, other products with this one, uh, a, uh, a learned intermediary is at the controls. That, that is, uh, that not everyone can buy it. You have to get permission from an expert in, in order to have this, um, uh, this product. Uh, and that way, the people who should not be ingesting or using the drug or device uh, will be kept from it, and the, uh, those who can benefit uh, will do so. Uh, so for years in class, uh, and so I've got a couple of students here, I've been saying uh, what a good idea uh, th this test is. It seems to really capture what's important about drugs and why they need to be treated uh, differently from other products. Uh, but uh, in preparing, I I've uh, cultivated um, a, a couple of misgivings. Uh, so to go through some of the downsides and upsides, and I, as I said, there, I, I think uh, the, uh, the former outnumber the, uh, the latter, um, I have um, a list of, of some problems uh, that I think um, in here uh, in the test for defect uh, that Aaron and Jim created. Uh, first, uh, prescription drugs are not uh, a, a, an ironclad barrier, to use another metaphor, not a, um, a wall. Uh, but in addition to a wall, uh, so that in individuals who want them can get them without prescriptions, I think, to some degree. Uh, the, the people who seek out drugs, the, you know, the, the uh, patients or consumers, may not know what they're getting or, or, or what they want. Uh, and the similar knowledge gaps appear also for uh, it's, uh, suppliers, that is to say, the, what uh, the, the restatement calls providers. Uh, these people are manipulated. Uh, I, I think there's some evidence to show uh, that the decision to make uh, a particular prescription um, or to give a, a prescription uh, is not necessarily informed or in the interest of the recipient of the prescription. Uh, the FDA authority on which the Section 6C rests, the idea that smarter people, learned people have figured out whether the drug is a good idea, uh, they, they may not be uh, as well informed as, as they ought to be. And lastly, uh, it's um, unfortunate, I think, uh, I don't entirely agree with the reception of, uh, of, of this um, section in the courts, but that has not been successful enough. And I rank that downside last because I don't really care what, what courts do. If the idea is good, I think uh, judges should be steeped in it and learn it and think about it some more. But after 20 years, it becomes relevant, although not dispositive, to consider whether judges are agreeing with the, uh, the black letter uh, that Section 6C provides. So with respect to the scalable prescription uh, wall, 
Uh, I don't really know if it's very easy to get uh, prescription drugs without prescriptions. If you have um, an internet address, uh, you're maybe familiar with the type of uh, spam that I'm uh, adverting to. Uh, I, I did a search of well, uh, how many hits I would get, and of course hit, th these numbers are not reliable data because Google tailors uh, its answers to histories and so forth, but I, I got 3.6 million or more, I should say, for Ambien, and even more for uh, Viagra. These are popular uh, uh, drugs uh, you know, sought out in, in this way. Uh, so the GAO, the, uh, the federal uh, agency, has tried to research the problem of obtaining prescription drugs without uh, prescriptions. And in one of their studies, uh, th they found that about half the time when you click on the link to buy the drug, um, you, you actually get it. So a, a lot of them are cons. Uh, it, 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 it's by no means certain that you can get over the prescription wall, but the, the wall is certainly not uh, uh, an, an insuperable barrier for people who really want to take the drug uh, that they don't have a prescription for. Uh, with respect to knowledge gaps on the on the customer side, uh, uh, drug consumers ha have been uh, receiving uh, television ads, and that's an, an important sector of the uh, direct to consumer advertising uh, f for 20 years. There's no preclearance on the ad copy, whereas the FDA is careful in, in scripting warnings and otherwise interfering or impeding, uh, interfering with or impeding the words that manufacturers want to speak. Uh, they don't actually screen commercials uh, for reliability. Uh, or, um, or accuracy, and some of the most notorious uh, products, uh, liability annals, um, drugs, uh, were heavily promoted to consumers um, uh, with television advertising. Continuing the downsides, uh, the uh, ignorance of physicians is also an area that, that I think relates to the infirmity of, uh, of Section 6C as a, a, a test. The informed provider should know a few things about whether a drug is a good idea to give out, and uh, I don't think that they all are as good as they ought to be on this front. Uh, when uh, a study shows a, a consequence, a, a, an instance of, of efficacy, uh, the study could be isolated. The, the results could be um, unreliable. And whether the uh, findings are even amenable to replication, let alone uh, replicatable, replicated in fact, uh, isn't something that, uh, that doctors necessarily know. Uh, they may not know the concept of statistical significance of the idea and the, to require um, to, to pass the efficacy hurdle, um, the FDA does not require that much difference in the result of a uh, the, the studied agent, the experimental group, compared to the uh, control group. So it may be the case that uh, a drug has a benefit, uh, but the uh, the benefit is trivial and it won't affect uh, most people who take the drug. Uh, th there's a kind of Bayesian problem about whether you, when you get a false positive uh, when you get a positive result, I should say, how likely it is to be a false. This was studied for, uh, 40 years ago, and uh, and doctors are really bad apparently in knowing what to infer from a positive result. Now, this doesn't really relate to the problem that Aaron and um, and, and Jim were trying to solve, but it does cast some doubt on the skill and, and prowess of uh, prescribers as they make their decisions. Uh, the um, problem of overpromotion uh, is is one that I want to get to. Uh, next, very significant uh, in fact, whereas I don't know that a lot of people are buying drugs without prescriptions by clicking on a, a spam, I do know that there's a hell of a lot of overpromotion uh, uh, going on. And it, it must be the case uh, that uh, the, the, the money is in some sense well spent. It, it, has, to, it has to work. I, I have to believe that uh, all of this expenditure uh, would not exist if it didn't make a difference um, on the ground. So um, my research assistant, who is not here, unfortunately, did uh, some excellent work uh, going through the, uh, the, the rap sheet of overpromotion, looking at instances of it. Uh, and I asked him to look for, um, I, I should say, that there's a, a couple of, this is from a, a spreadsheet or a, 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 a document that I have in my computer, that, and there are many, many others. I just picked a few to, to uh, identify a couple of big name uh, drug manufacturers. It doesn't seem to be aligned uh, too well. Uh, but what I've got here is um, the, the, the drug of Neurontin, uh, which is um, approved for epilepsy but marketed for uh, bipolar disorder and many other uh, conditions. Uh, uh, Seristin was de designed for AIDS wasting, uh, but the, uh, uh, the, the manufacturer decided to reinterpret the, uh, the concept of wasting uh, and, and then pushed it on, um, on, on um, uh, physicians. A um, couple of cancer drugs um, promoted for um, unapproved treatments, treatments that the, FB, that the FDA did not acknowledge as valid. Zyprexa may be the most infamous of, of these uh, drugs that's cut off there, but that XA is the end of them, uh, of uh, Zyprexa, approved for psychotic uh, disorders, uh, but promoted for aggression, agitation, depression. And, um, Alzheimer's and other conditions. So these are some of the results. Uh, it, and I guess this part will be uh, a, a visible. Park Davis pleads guilty and pays uh, $430 million to settle uh, criminal and civil charges. The Serono uh, fee or, or bottom line tab ends up being you know, much more than that. 
uh, got, got another guilty plea and a, um, a 435 million uh, uh, payment by, um, for the cancer drugs. And Lilly you know, crosses into the billions um, for, for Zyprexa, uh, 800 million in civil penalties and uh, 500 for a criminal. Uh, I infer that there's a lot of, as I said, a lot of um, overpromotion uh, going on, and I think that has to have an effect on both, um, or not only, I should say, the, uh, the prescribing decisions, but overpromotion efforts are aimed um, at physicians, uh, but also at uh, consumers. When you hear uh, all the buzz about your friends and your, um, the people you know using a particular drug, uh, it must be the case, I think, uh, that, uh, that patients push to get these drugs uh, that they uh, should not have. So that's, um, uh, uh, these are some of the downsides, but I'm not yet quite finished with them, and I have more to say when I'm done with them. Uh, if the FDA is underfunded, uh, then it may be making ill-informed decisions about whether to approve um, a, a drug. Now, uh, I, I write there, uh, you know, says who, how much is much, because it's kind of cheap and easy to say the, that an agency is not funded enough to do a good job. So to get authority for my proposition, to kind of footnote uh, the assertion, I turn to the masters themselves um, and, and uh, note where they say that the, the FDA is un too underfunded to do its job of pre-marketing uh, approval correctly. Uh, this is uh, the article about um, comment K uh, that, that Aaron um, and Jim published a couple of years ago, uh, where they write, in making decisions with regard to safety and efficacy, the FDA relies almost exclusively on data developed by private drug manufacturers. FDA decisions are thus vulnerable to an extent that judicial decisions are not. That's Mark's reference to the common law. The FDA is going to be worse uh, than a court. To being influenced by understatements and misstatements of the relevant risks. Uh, so I don't think we have good enough preclearance to be confident that the drug is uh, presumptively, as uh, 6C says, uh, n n not defectively designed. Um, as for judicial reception, uh, again, I've gone through uh, a data set, and my data set comes uh, from uh, the uh, a record uh, that, as you might imagine, Aaron keeps a very close watch on how the restatement fares um, in, the, in the courts, and I, I took a, a PDF from him uh, that uh, cites uh, 30 judicial opinions uh, that, that cites Section 6C. Uh, I found only one robust embrace of the theory. The one that I lecture in torts as being such a great idea, I found only one judge who said so, and unfortunately, uh, he's a dissenter. Uh, in um, in, in uh, uh, Bryant, the majority uh, disapproves of Section 6C. Uh, there are other hostility um, opinions. The casebook that I use by uh, uh, John Goldberg and, and colleagues uh, uh, repeats at, at the Freeman case with Accutane, a, a lengthy, lengthy attack on, uh, well, not lengthy, lengthy, but a uh, relatively harsh attack on, um, on Section 6C. So there's a hostility idea. But the majority of citations to Section 6C don't really engage with the idea at all. So you got the plurality of them, you know, just cite it but don't discuss it. Uh, there are five that say it's not the, uh, the law, it's not the law of the jurisdiction. There's a procedural problem. The defendant messed up. Uh, it, it, uh, one court approved of it, saying only that Texas approves the restatement. And it, the, it's, its big fan base is Arizona. But even there, there's one court saying uh, that it, it, it doesn't like, that the, uh, the author of the opinion doesn't like uh, the case. Uh, again, I not, should not be fatal. It could be the case uh, that the judges are mistaken about uh, what uh, the test for uh, drug design uh, defect ought to be. But we now have uh, a couple of decades uh, of experience uh, uh, identifying some resistance uh, on the part of the constituency to which um, Aaron and Jim uh, spoke. Now, for the upsides, I, I have only one in mind, and, and that is the, the whole point of, uh, of Section 6C. A, a very effective, very useful, and very unsafe drug might be headed our way, and the manufacturer will be discouraged from bringing it to market. The lawyers um, like Paul will, will be keeping an eye on, on them and ready, and be, would be um, quite content to take them down. You know, and, and even I, I, I've researched the work uh, that, that Paul did uh, uh, against um, the manufacturers of, of, of DES. He's a formidable um, adversary. And, uh, and so the, um, I, I imagine drug manufacturers would be skittish about uh, encountering or inviting a, a very severe liability uh, risk. So that's the, that's the big upside. Now, good old common K, which we've heard about uh, uh, from Mark, uh, has a, a comment that Mark has already told us about, uh, and here it is. Uh, a, a, an outstanding example uh, is the vaccine for the pasture treatment of rabies, which not uncommonly leads to very serious and damaging consequences, when it, or nasty side effects, I believe, was how um, 
how Mark put it. So this is uh, Prosser's uh, rationale for uh, saying that there's such a thing as an unre un unavoidably unsafe drug, and, and we just um, have to live with it. Uh, so uh, Section uh, 6C anticipates the, the next Pasteur uh, vaccine. It says when it comes, we need to be ready, and we need to give the manufacturers a, a, a safe harbor uh, to make this useful drug available uh, to a constituency of, uh, of patients. So that is the, the very harmful uh, and, and very useful drug. Now, I, I just don't think it's coming, and I, um, it, it's not an accident, I think, that Pasteur did his vaccine experiment in, in 1885, you know, more than 100 uh, years ago. Now, I know squat about how to market it, how to invent a new drug, or, or, or what's necessary or desirable, but I have to think that uh, people who are working in the labs uh, uh, and inventing drugs these days are steeped in an ideology of safety that Pasteur never dreamed of when he was uh, mixing rabbit co concoctions um, in, in France. Uh, and similarly, uh, I, I guess um, even you know, more recent drugs like the polio vaccine uh, were done with less heed for the, the possibility of, of downside. So I think uh, that, uh, although I can't prove it, I don't even know if, it, if it's even plausible. You see, you know, you be the judge. I, I think when people are inventing drugs, they will have safety on, on their minds and they will be um, internalizing a worry uh, that, that uh, Section 60 is designed to, to guard against. So we have not yet seen the, the, the analog to the Pasteur uh, vaccine um, in, in my lifetime. And if it's not coming, then we have a lot of downsides and a very weak upside in the um, weighing of, um, of the value of Section 6C. So uh, I, I don't know if it's my job to repair the problem that I've um, identified, but I, I believe I have a couple of minutes. So uh, I wonder what would be the alternative test for design defect if, as I suggest, the courts jettison it uh, and switch to something else. Again, go back to the source. Uh, you can find anything you want to know in the writings um, of uh, Aaron Tversky. And the authors here in the Baylor article uh, have uh, this uh, recitation. They, they, they say there are at least eight alternative tests if you don't want to use uh, Section 6C. So I've paid a copy paste of them here with the, the last uh, inch or so on the left uh, removed. I hope you get uh, a sense of, of, of the volume of the alternatives. Uh, now, it's not visible either, and I won't try to read it, but I've crossed out the ones that I personally don't like, um, and I've left the ones that I personally <laughs> do like for what that may be worth, and the ones that are not yet crossed out are the ones that I think are worth uh, uh, considering. Uh, uh, that said, I uh, speak and, and uh, create slides with great admiration uh, for the um, ambition and, and, and uh, novelty of, of uh, Section uh, 6C, and I think we'll end up with better drug design uh, defect law uh, after uh, the, the um, risks and utility uh, of it are weighed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Kathleen Sharkey of the New York University School of Law. Uh, <clears throat> She is the Crystal Eastman Professor of Law at NYU. Um, she is a prolific author um, in um, a ton of areas of tort law uh, and, and has a special interest in this area of <clears throat> a drug design because of her um, great interest in, and uh, wonderful scholarship in the area of, um, of drug preemption. Um, so, without further ado, I give you um, Catherine Sharkey. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, it's a delight to be here. Um, the only disappointment is to learn that a vast amount of the field of my scholarship, thinking, uh, teaching is a dirty word, uh, Paul. So I've, had to, I've been mulling that over. I've thought to myself, I've been uh, mocked before because I'm interested in products liability, preemption, what's the next P, et cetera, but not the, the dirty word aspect. But it's actually, in all seriousness, gives me an opportunity to um, suggest um, that I've been thinking a long time from an intellectual perspective about the role of federal preemption. I don't consider myself as um, being particularly on one side or the other of the V in these very hotly contested plaintiff versus defendant. In fact, as an academic, it's sort of a point of pride that I get called sometimes by the right-leaning groups like the Federalist Society as the kind of liberal commentator upon whom they can um, slay various um, 
uh, controversial remarks, but equally from the uh, ACS on the other side is more the kind of right-leaning person. So I don't know um, what that means exactly, except I think the dirty word P, um, we need to step back and look at first a little bit more broadly. So what is federal preemption and what are um, what are the strains of law we have to understand to engage deeply in that field? So the first thing to say is um, that preemption merges fields. It merges the field of tort law, products liability law, state-based law with federal law. And um, that's really important because I think a lot of times some people look at this topic of preemption from one vantage point versus the other. Um, indeed, about a decade ago, Margaret Berger invited me to a really provocative conference here. And I went back and I was thinking about, I hope I've come some distance in the last decade, but in a sense, as I was rereading some of the recent case law developments and looking at how the courts are struggling in this area, there are some um, foundational points that we were talking about then. At that moment, what I was interested in, in terms of this federal preemption drug cases, and this was pre-Bartlett, pre-Mensing, the kinds of cases that Paul was talking about that I'm going to get to, I was really intrigued looking at state courts versus federal courts and how they were looking at the preemption of state tort law. And I, I published a short piece. It's, it's um, quasi-empirical. I tried to look at a lot of cases and then make some broad generalizations. But I think a real systematic study, like a, a re-examination, might be interesting. Um, in the state courts, the state courts were much more likely to think about these as tort law, the purview of states, right? And um, thinking about, for example, how regulatory compliance is not a dispositive defense. And so they were very reluctant to, as a dispositive matter, throw out uh, claims of failure to warn or design defect already in the federal courts. So there were vast, there were a bunch of um, federal district courts. And these are, by and large, I was looking at failure to warn cases. So I'll come back to that. But this was pre Wyeth versus Levine, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. It's a big US Supreme Court that um, Paul didn't have time to talk about, predated the Pliva versus Mensing in the Bartlett case. Federal courts were giving. Um, a lot of credence to the idea that we're talking about an FDA approved not only drug but warning and giving what an administrative law is called Chevron deference, namely mandatory deference to the position being brought forward by the FDA, which at the time was an aggressive pro preemption provision, and they were knocking out the state law. And I thought to myself then, and I still think today, that one of the biggest conceptual uh, difficulties um, is that we have this divide between thinking about issues from a common law state tort perspective and then thinking about it from an administrative law regulatory perspective. And actually, it's a divide in the academy. There are very few people who teach both tort law and administrative law. I tend to think that's a good thing to do. Obviously, this is self-referential in part. But I think when you think in terms of litigating these cases, actually, I'd be interested to hear from some of the practitioners. I've talked to many over the years who have talked about, for example, plaintiff attorneys who now, in light of federal preemption, have had to really become steeped in the FDA regulatory process to try to make it very clear to courts what the FDA has or hasn't looked at. Uh, Anita is exactly right, and Aaron made this point as well. The FDA is not um, perfect, is not infallible, it's not, it might be underfunded. What's interesting to think about, again, just step back, is in the products liability realm, we have a variety of regulatory agencies, right? We have the FDA, we have NHTSA regulating automobiles, we have the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I have to say, I was teaching torts for a long, long time, and I never thought at all about the Consumer Product Safety Commission. What do they do? I think they were regulating, you know, mattresses and children's to toys. And as when I went to European countries to talk about, um, you know, US tort law, they all said, well, you have this very powerful agency that decides all these matters. And I said, I don't, what, are you, what agency are you talking about? The Consumer Product Safety Commission. So um, what's interesting to me is the FDA, amongst our federal regulatory agencies, is probably the most well-funded, is the gold standard, is more regular, you, you know, it applies more scrutiny to drugs than the equivalent bodies, regulatory bodies in Europe, other countries. You often hear about how drugs can enter the market elsewhere, but not in the US. So from a comparative institutional perspective, we're talking about 
um, a regulatory body that does ex ante screening, right? For most products, you have to do very little in the US to bring your product to the market, and then tort law kind of polices and takes care that that product's gonna be safe. Not so with medical devices, prescription drugs and medical devices, right? If I just go set up shop and start selling widgets, like it's pretty easy to do that in the US. If I start setting up shop and selling drugs or medical devices, I end up in jail, right? So we have pre-clearance. These products are different. Medical devices and drugs, prescription drugs, are different from other products. So I think we have to recognize that, but I think it's a balance. So what, where does this all lead us? Let's step back now and think about federal preemption. First of all, there are more institutions than courts thinking about state tort law, right? First, we have Congress which we haven't heard about yet, and we have federal agencies. And what's fascinating to me about preemption is that the first thing we have to understand is while we have state tort law, right? We could have Congress decide to come forward and have national products liability law and resolve certain standards. Should this be a consumer expectations test, risk utility? Should we have national uniformity of law? We don't have that. Sometimes state courts decide, therefore, it's all up to us as the highest state court. This is a state tort issue, and we're not gonna think about the federal regulatory regime that hard. Well, that's not true either, right? We have Congress intervening selectively in certain areas, passing federal laws. So the one that's important for our discussion today is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, right? They come in and they pass legislation and then delegate authority to the FDA, which may be underfunded and have problems, but they pass reams of regulations, very detailed regulations, set up a very stringent ex-ante screening that you have to go through three different levels of clinical trials. Yes, the data is given from the defendant manufacturers by and large, but it would be um, really difficult to think about a scheme by which we, um, as a society decided to publicly fund the FDA to do all of that clinical research and it might have certain of its own problems uh, with that as well. Interestingly, this touches a little bit on um, some points Anita was making, which I hope we'll get back to maybe in, um, in discussion. The FDA is very um, intriguingly regulating not just health and safety, mechanisms of drugs and medical devices, but they are regulating and policing information. And that's a very controversial modern day issue. How much should they be doing so? So for example, with respect to overpromotion, this is just one example, but the FDA, right, pr uh, approves a drug for a particular intended use. They do not tell doctors how they can prescribe that, right, the quote unquote off label. But they have, and this is a very controversial issue today, but they have, by and large, they have restrictions that the drug manufacturer can't promote that for the off-label use. And many people say, oh, that's a First Amendment issue, that's terrible, why is the FDA involved in that? One of the underlying normative reasons that might be a positive thing is the FDA is trying to induce manufacturers to come back to the FDA with that clinical trial evidence, right? It's a way to increase the production of information, the risk utility information that the FDA needs to resolve these issues. And only if they come back to the FDA and get an approval for that second use can they promote it, right? There's a whole other issue. I mean, I teach a class on regulation of um, drugs and medical devices over in Europe. The idea that we allow television advertising for prescription drugs, we're alone with New Zealand on that one, right? So that's a, that's a separate debate about what's going on and um, very interesting. You can look at, ex again, there is a regulatory framework. It used to be that the FDA didn't allow for drug manufacturers to advertise on TV unless they gave equal time, right, to the downsides as the upsides. So if you go back and watch uh, ads from um, the, the um, earlier time period, you see all of these you know, skies and sunlight and people very happy. And they say, you know, ask your doctor if you want to be this happy, but you don't know what, what to ask for. I've watched these ads. I mean, I don't know why people were spending money on them. They're hysterical. But um, today, the FDA changed that and allowed, so long as the promoter said things like, you know, call this 1-800 number, go to this website, right? So we could get into whether certain regulatory decisions were right or wrong. My emphatic point is it's really important to understand precisely 
seriously what the FDA is doing, how they're regulating something. And how this comes back into preemption decisions is I think that courts need to be very attuned if the idea is that the FDA has rigorously looked at the particular design defect, the particular failure to warn, has decided that they have said this is the optimal level at which we want to have a warning on this. They've looked at evidence about adding an extra warning and they've looked at studies that have shown that on balance that would cause more harm than good, then that maybe should preempt that particular um, alleged failure to warn or design defect. But it doesn't mean that we should have wholesale field preemption, right? Just because we have an FDA regulating an area, you never should be able to bring any kind of state tort law claim. And much of the confusion, I think, comes into play with courts and some academics misunderstanding this and deciding they're either thumbs up or thumbs down on preemption. And there's a lot of that when you read the case law carefully. As Paul was mentioning, some of these decisions you might agree with the outcome or not, but when you try to think about what's their analytical focus, it's a little bit missing. And these are, you know, um, these are actual decided cases. So back to my uh, framework, and I'm going to make a few um, points before uh, ceding the territory to Aaron and then some further um, discussion. We've got Congress, as I mentioned. So in the area we're talking about, Congress passes the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. It's really important that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act had an express preemption provision for medical devices in the medical device amendment to that act. That's what governed the Regal case that Paul put up there before. That's why that decision seems very different to me from another line of preemption that's called implied preemption. What is implied preemption? Implied preemption means that Congress, in its infinite wisdom, when it passes certain regulatory statutes, like the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, decides not to engage in the question of how this regulatory framework should interface with state tort law. There is no question that Congress, if it wanted to, could resolve many preemption disputes with the stroke of the pen, right? Could decide whether or not there should or shouldn't be preemption thumbs up or thumbs down. Many people think that would be good for Congress to do. I don't because I think preemption is a much more nuanced question that depends very much on the precise regulatory framework, namely how stringently has the regulatory agency looked at the precise um, alleged defect, the risk utility balance, et cetera, that's before them. But I also um, I also think that um, sometimes we forget in the world of implied preemption, we're not doing a parsing of statutory language that Congress gave us, right? What we're doing there is a kind of analysis under implied preemption, you have um, what's known as field preemption and then conflict preemption. So if I drew a little chart, we, I would finally tell you we're down here talking about impossibility preemption, but before we get there, we should understand the structure. So implied preemption means even though Congress hasn't passed a specific express preemption clause, we are going to as the name suggests, imply or infer a clash between state tort law and the federal regulatory structure. So under implied, under implied preemption, you can have a very wide form called field preemption, which basically means that because we're in an area that's so highly federal regulated, all of tort law should cede to it. That drug manufacturers don't even invoke field preemption anymore. They used to. Academics by and large don't support that, that concept. Uh, Mark and I have a colleague, Richard Epstein, who's an emphatic supporter about field preemption. So I can't say that no uh, reputable intellectual people would argue for field preemption, but that's a very broad concept. We then are in the world of conflict preemption. So conflict preemption doesn't mean it's the federal regulatory structure is going to oust state tort law entirely, but it means we have to look at whether state tort law right, is is getting in the way of, there's some kind of conflict, right? There's a clash with the federal regulatory scheme. Even within this conflict preemption, there's a narrower form called impossibility. And that's most of the cases that we were talking about and that we're going to talk, uh, I think, a little bit more in the Q&A period. Impossibility, again, the one thing I tell students what's great, usually in um, many areas of the law, the name we give it kind of means the opposite. Here the names also kind of give us a clue what they mean. Impossibility is supposed to be that you're between a rock and a hard place in layman's terms, right? That the defendant manufacturer could not um, abide by state and federal law. 
And if that's the case, then you know what? We have in our Constitution the Supremacy Clause that says that federal law is going to trump. So you can't have the state law tell a manufacturer, you must do X. You must put this warning on your drug if the FDA has said, you may not put that warning on the drug. Right? That's a clash and that's an impossibility. There's a broader form that's called obstacle preemption. To my mind, that's the most interesting realm of preemption. Obstacle preemption is the idea that there's no impossibility, right? You could um, conform to state and federal law, but it would undermine, right, or frustrate the purposes and objectives of the federal regulatory system. My argument to date has been that we should think about for courts what I've called a, um, an agency reference model. And I called it that because there were a lot of cases that I alluded to before where courts were giving deference to the FDA. Oh, the FDA says there should be preemption? They don't like state tort law? Okay, preemption, Chevron deference. I'm not in favor of that model, nor am I in favor of the model, though, with a state court saying, the FDA, who are they? Right? I don't like federal agencies. They're underfunded. We protect people here in our state. Right? The agency reference model is between those two poles and suggests that courts need to get input from the uh, federal regulator about uh, precisely what they were doing in this, in this area. Okay, so how does this apply in some of these um, really interesting cases? I have about five minutes to give you some examples. And I think here I will, with um, admiration, piggyback on Paul's laying out of the cases. Hopefully we can, um, we can remember back uh, to this morning. He talked about a case that was called Yates. This is the Sixth Circuit case, Yates versus Ortho McNeil. This was the birth control patch uh, pill. And what I want to do is situate this case first. So this was a case where the plaintiffs raised both pre-approval design defect and post-approval design defect, right? They tried to be very creative. They tried to say um, that they should be able to bring those claims uh, forward. And the court would have none of this. You'll recall, at least Paul said, this is a good case for defendants, right? So defendants like this because the court's going to have nothing of it. Now, what's interesting to me is in their pre-approval uh, preemption uh, section, here's a line from the case, quote, no federal law restricts a brand name drug manufacturer from designing a reasonably safe product prior to FDA approval. Okay, that's interesting. No federal law um, in this area. However, there's impossibility preemption. Right? To me, that makes no sense. I think what the court is really doing is through the rubric of impossibility preemption, kind of doing um, at least obstacle preemption and maybe field preemption, right? Usually federal uh, impossibility preemption is there is a direct conflict between what the federal law says that you have to do and what the state law says that you have to do. So I'm not such a huge fan um, of that. Uh, at least the analytics in terms of getting to that result. But I want to end because I think um, we didn't talk in Paul's rendition of these case laws and the ways that plaintiffs are creatively trying to come forward to bring claims. He didn't put so much attention in the post-approval design change area. And I actually think this is a rife and really interesting uh, area. There are some courts that have decided that once the FDA has approved the, um, the uh, drug, that if any kind of modification, et cetera, is alleged, so they approved a drug with a certain amount of estrogen in it, and then it comes to light that the um, plaintiff says that they should have modified this, right, to lower the amount, et cetera. This is in the post-approval. Should all of those claims just be wiped out? There's a really interesting um, divide, I think, going on in some of these um, federal district court cases where the crux of impossibility preemption is coming down to an understanding of the FDA regulatory framework. And I think that's right. And the only thing that I think these cases are missing in terms of embracing the kind of um, agency reference model that I'd like to see is that there, um, there's still imperfections in terms of how the courts are understanding what the FDA would think about the precise issue before them. So there's a case that I um, asked to be added into the CLE materials that I'm going to reference called Gustavson versus Alcorn Labs from the District of Massachusetts. It's currently on appeal in the First Circuit. In fact, last Friday, the parties just filed the opening appellate um, uh, brief. So it's a really interesting, I think, case that we can look at now and then watch as it goes forward. Interestingly, in the case, it's about um, eye drops, prescription eye drops, and it's about the quantity of the, 
the prescription eye drop that's in each of the droppers. So there's all this scientific evidence that you only need a smaller amount of the prescription eye drop to do to be safe and efficacious and to treat various conditions like glaucoma and other things. But the defendant manufacturers, it's alleged, are adding three times that amount in the dropper. And they're doing so, right, to induce consumers to spend more money, et cetera, and there might also be some health and safety risks. So the interesting question in, these, in this case, and there are a bunch of class actions all over the country, I'm just picking this one out because it's uh, very current and the appeal is gonna be um, ongoing, is our changes to the dropper, right? This was something that got FDA approval, but our changes to the dropper to reduce the size, what kinds of changes are these? Are these major changes? Are they moderate changes? Are they minor changes? Why is this important? Well, if you look at the, closely at the federal regulatory structure, major changes you can't do as a manufacturer without FDA pre-approval. Moderate changes you can do and then subsequently inform the FDA. Now, of course, if you make that change and the FDA decides after it studies the issue that you did the wrong thing, as a manufacturer, they can have the final say. And minor changes you just have to publish somewhere so people are aware of that. Really important on this preemption question, it would seem, right? So what's fascinating to me about this case is the parties dispute the interpretation of the FDA guidance on what is a major, moderate, minor kinds of change. Absolutely, they all agree. Here's what's really interesting. They all agree if it's a major change, there would be preemption. Not all cases um, have actually decided that. There's another case uh, we were mentioning in the lead up to today. Are there any cases out there that say a major change that, are, that requires pre-approval of the FDA would not be preempted? There's actually one called Warren versus Boeinger. Uh, pharmaceuticals from the Southern District of Indiana that actually says no, even major changes, so long as the only way is if the manufacturer shows that the FDA, there's clear evidence that the FDA would not give that pre-approval. So, but here in Gustafson, we have the parties conceding that a major change would, in, would um, require preemption because it requires the FDA to have the last, the, the first word about whether something, uh, whether the manufacturer can or can't conform to the state law duty about changing, in this instance, the dropper size, et cetera. So what do courts do, right? To my mind, they're doing the wrong thing. They're like looking at the text of the guidance from the FDA. They're listening to arguments by the parties. Why don't they solicit the view of the FDA? Why don't they see what the FDA's interpretation of that guidance is? There's a really interesting doctrine called primary jurisdiction. Justice Breyer recently uh, talked about this in an ongoing uh, different area of the law, but a, an administrative law case. He said, why isn't anyone talking about this doctrine that nobody's talking about? That's what he asked the, well, because people have kind of forgotten about it. Primary jurisdiction is a doctrine that allows for the court to kind of certify, in a sense, a question to the underlying federal uh, regulatory agency. Now, uh, there are all sorts of problems with that approach that maybe we can get into. I want to just suggest in closing one thing. It's not always the case that the FDA is going to say, preempt, 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 and then we're back to Paul's, this is just a dirty word. There was an interesting case um, in Massachusetts where the FDA had approved a very high potency opioid called Zohydro, and the attorney, the, um, the governor decided to ban its sale in the state and uh, I, added, I asked for this uh, also to be added into the CLE materials. It turns out the court decided this was preempted, uh, but didn't ask what the FDA thought about it. And the FDA actually thought, had thought very much that even though they wanted this to have been approved, that they were very eager actually to have states regulate how it's prescribed, what, who can get it, et cetera, et cetera, and that never came into play, right? That should come into play in terms of whether or not any kind of state regulatory mechanisms, whether they're common law or through uh, positive law, are interfering with the FDA's regulatory structure. So uh, I wish courts were doing that a little more. My understanding from seeing where the litigation is going is that litigants more and more are are thinking about how to frame their state law tort cases um, in light of trying to in, um, get information before the court to really understand in a deeper sense the federal regulatory structure. And to my mind, I think that's all to the good. Thank you.
materials. There's a very interesting piece by Professor Sharkey uh, dealing with that Massachusetts uh, situation. It's a fascinating piece. <clears throat> I urge you, to, if you haven't read it yet, to read it. <clears throat> Let me start out by saying that we need to understand why it is that we're in this business of trying to figure out design defect in, uh, in drugs. There are two reasons that plaintiffs are um, <clears throat> pushing the design issue, at least in my opinion. One is the fact that, and, and this was true in, in, in Bartlett, and, it's, um, and in um, our Baylor piece, I said a lot, a lot of the cases dealing with this. Plaintiffs bring their case on failure to warn, and there clearly is a failure to warn. But the evidence is, is that the doctor, who should have been warned under the learned intermediary do uh, doctrine, the doctor testifies that he never looked at the warning, never looked at the material. So the question is, how can the failure to warn be a cause if the doctor never would have read it? <clears throat> now there is, that sometimes turns out to be a fact issue because the doctor will say, I never read it, and the, and the, the question is, is, is the doctor to be, to be believed? It's a credibility issue. But <clears throat> a lot of the cases that go to push the design is because, not because they're, they can't make out a failure to warn. They can, plaintiffs can make out a failure to warn. They can't make out causation because the doctor screws it up. The doctor says, I did not read the warning. I would not have read the warning. Or, <clears throat> and sometimes it, the doctor will say, I know the information from other sources and I did it anyway. Um, and so the question then in, in, in gets to design because the failure to warn cause of action dies. The other situation is, is where there really has been very adequate warning. Um, and the contention then is, is that this drug should never have been on the market. Um, in the Fenton cases, um, there was, um, uh, at least the way it's reported in the Pennsylvania case, um, the, um, it, the court says that the warnings were adequate and the, um, and, um, and the uh, plaintiff is pushing the design issue on the ground that the, that the drug never should have been on the market. But I think the first issue, the first situation is, is, um, is most prevalent is that the plaintiffs, now it's, it is not a, um, um, a pushover to, to, to do a design case. The warning cases are much simpler, much more direct. They, do the, they, they go to design because they're forced to go to design because the plaintiffs can't get through past the causation issue on warning. Okay, um, Professor Sharkey <clears throat> um, correctly pointed out that the, the cases break down between um, post-approval design defect and pre-approval design defect. Um, <clears throat> from what I have seen, and I did not see the Warren case that Professor Sharkey um, alluded to, Every case that I've seen um, that has <clears throat> preempted is a post-approval design defect case, and they, the, that is the FDA has approved the, the drug, and the question is, should the drug have had a different composition um, <clears throat> in, you know, <clears throat> or <clears throat> some kind of different con configuration? Um, <clears throat> The cases are close to unanimous on post-approval design defect that, um, that um, a change pro proposed by the plaintiff um, is preemptive. Um, 
I will agree very much with Professor Sharkey that it is very hard when you read the cases to understand whether they're making a common law argument or whether they're making a preemption argument. Uh, but in the post-approval design defect cases, it seems to me that they are making a, a, a constitutional argument. Um, and it stems from the language in, in Bartlett, uh, which is very broad, um, that, um, that if you are proposing a change in the constellation of the drug, um, that, that, um, that that is preempted uh, because you cannot do that any change that is a major change has got to go through uh, what a new drug application. And let's understand that a new drug application, that if you make a change in the, in the chemistry of the drug, um, and, or a new drug application is um, a very complex business. It takes years to, and a huge amount of testing, animal testing, um, patient testing, um, it's a very often a multi-year process, sometimes as long as six and seven years, and can run, the cost for it can run into over a billion dollars. Um, so the courts are not ha hospitable to, um, to changes in the constellation of the drug. The interesting thing about the, the case that, that um, Catherine was talking about with the, um, with the um, uh, the container of the, is that seems to be pretty mechanical in, in, and it's not chemical but it's mechanical um, and um, <clears throat> more it's more akin almost to a drug device case than it is to, to a pharmaceutical case be that as it may <clears throat> there is I think fairly clear um, picture that post-approval, post FDA approval, design defect cases are going to be preempted. The pre-approval cases are <clears throat> more difficult. And here, in, and I'll let me read you from, from the Yates' opinion. Plaintiff's argument regarding defendant's pre-approval duty is too attenuated. To imagine such a pre-approval duty exists, we would have to speculate that had defendants designed the drug differently, the FDA would have approved the alternate design. Next, we would have to assume that the plaintiff would have selected this hypothetical product. Further yet, we would have to suppose that the alternate design would not have caused plaintiff's injury. This is several steps too far. Even if New York law requires defendants to produce and market a different design, the ultimate availability to plaintiff is contingent upon whether the FDA would approve the alternate design in the first place. Um, in the Pliva case, um, uh, Justice Thomas called it the mousetrap argument. Um, and, um, and that is, you, know, you have to go through so many steps. And you know, who, who says that the, the FDA would ever have, have approved it? Who says that, that if, if they had approved it, that it wouldn't? that it would have taken hold and that plaintiffs would have used, used it. Um, in contending that defendant's pre-approval duty would have resulted in a product with a different formulation, plaintiff essentially argued that defendant should never have sold the FDA approved the formulation of the drug in the first place. We reject this never start selling rationale for the same reason the Supreme Court in Bartlett rejected the stop selling rationale of the First Circuit. So <clears throat> we've got in cases on both sides of the issue with regard to um, um, preemption um, that is predicated on whether or not they should have uh, changed the formulation of the drug, changed the, um, the container to whatever, should have done that before sending it to the FDA. The difficulty with that really is, is that if we are dealing with something that really is chemical, that does, that does require a new drug application, we're talking about something that's very, very complex, and there's good reason to believe that that, that, that kind of preemption will stick. I think, I think Professor Shark is absolutely right that it's going to be very case specific. <clears throat> Then there is 
another form of, of um, possible defect, and that's the one that I think that um, um, that Professor Bernstein talked about, and that is, let's look at the pro the drug risk utility. Does the drug net out more utility than risk? And we took that aim at that in our article, and it's and it's very difficult. If we assume that the drug is a valuable drug for a class of patients, should we then hold the drug to be defective because patient misuse, doctor misprescription, not because of doctor's ignorance or doctor's failure to, to prescribe the drug adequately, <clears throat> um, over promotion, whatever you have, the fact of the matter is that the drug is good and has real value for a class of patients. Do we want to sit as arbiters saying that drug, which has valuable value for a class of patients, um, will <clears throat> be held to be defective because in the aggregate, in the aggregate, it does more damage than it does good? I would think that that's the place for warning or clinical malpractice, um, but that we ought not to ban, we ought not to declare that drug de defective if there is a legitimate use for the drug. I <clears throat> would hate to be told that I can't get a drug because <clears throat> there are some doctors out there who are misprescribing the drug, or that there are patients out there who are misusing the drug. Um, so. The question of whether or not we ought to use a flat-out risk utility test, that the drug in its aggregate causes more harm than good, leaves me with very uncomfortable feeling. I don't like it. I don't like it. Um, and I don't know whether or not the courts will preempt it. I don't know whether the courts will preempt it. It may very well be that that's another area of, there's, that's another area of preemption. Finally, I get to section six, and that is a drug is defective in design if it's no damn good for any class of patients, and that no reasonable medical provider would have provided the drug to any class of patients. Um, and, um, and Professor Bernstein is absolutely right that we have not gotten a warm reception from the courts. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, we haven't also had courts addressing it in, in a um, scholarly or even an intensive fashion. And they said, well, that, you know, that's too defense oriented. Well, that doesn't do a lot for me because I'd like to know whether or not why, why they're turning it down. <clears throat> um, my problem with, with what Professor Bernstein has said, and she doesn't disagree, disagree with this, but um, um, is that you know, the flat out risk utility um, aspect of a test um, is, I think, policy wise bad. <clears throat> and, um, and yes, we, uh, it relies on. Um, on doctors prescribing wisely, prescribing. it relies on um, adequate warning, it relies on the fact that people are going to be making decisions. Um, the, the fact that drug advertisements are, are a part of the uh, scene here in, in this country, and it's quite correct, it's not only us in, in New Zealand who does it. On the other hand, if you've been watching your drug advertisements on television, they are very different than they were 10 years ago or they were five years ago. They are, you know, and before it used to be what I call it, just to have the smiley page where everybody was happy and, not, and, and almost nothing about the unhappiness. Now there's plenty of about the unhappiness in the drugs. So maybe, <clears throat> maybe it's a lot more balanced and more reason to think about that. Nonetheless, <clears throat> um, uh, I still think that Section 6C is our is the best test around. 
simply because the only alternative, and, and I went, we went through all of those lists of all the ones that Professor Bernstein knocked off. She was right in knocking them off. Um, but the only one she left, really left on was this risk utility test that does more good, good does more harm than good. And as I said, that one leaves me very cold. Now, <clears throat> I want to say a word about the Bartlett case. Bartlett was a case that arose under New Hampshire law. And the court said <clears throat> that under New Hampshire law, tort law is regulatory. That is, you either have to have a better warning or a better design. And the court said you can't have a better warning because, because it's the, um, the case deals with a, a generic drug and you can't mimic, it has to mimic the warning of the grand name manufacturer. You can't have a design change because if you have to make a design change, um, you're again violating, um, um, you're again violating uh, that. I think the court got New Hampshire law wrong. New Hampshire law really is flat out risk utility because in the case called Vitur versus something rather, <clears throat> Vitur versus Body Master Sports Industries, what happened in that case is it was a leg press machine and the court said, and plaintiff, uh, defendants argued that there was no reasonable alternative. There was a, there was a danger with, with regard to the use of the machine, and, the, and defendants argued there was no reasonable alternative design. They argued the restatement test that you have to have a reasonable alternative design. The court turned that down. And from all we can see from the case is that there was adequate warning. So we had a case where there was adequate warnings and no design, and the court said it, flung, it could flunk risk utility which means that the court was emba embracing a flat out risk utility test like the kind that Professor Bernstein was talking about. It was not regulatory. It didn't ask them to do anything. It asked them, it simply said, if you have a product whose risk outweighs its utility, you are gonna pay damages, flat out. <clears throat> that's not regulatory. That's, that's simply saying, not I want anything from you other than, than that if you sell the product, you're going, to be, you're going to be in touch. In that case, <clears throat> Judge, Justice Alito, in a footnote, says, we can thus say for another day the question whether a true absolute liability state law system could give rise to impossibility preemption. As we have noted, most common law causes of action for negligence and strict liability do not exist merely to spread risk, but rather impose affirmative duties. My contention with Alito was is he misread New Hampshire law, and footnote one should have been addressed because footnote one is the risk utility test that, <coughs> um, that, uh, um, that Professor Bernstein uh, paid attention to. And, um, that's the question that's going to haunt the courts. They're going to have to deal with that question. Um, and um, they can deal with it either as a common law issue, as I've said, as a common law issue, I think it's the wrong test. Uh, <clears throat> but they may deal with it also as a constitutional issue in which says you can't sell the product even though it's approved. Um, and. Um, so tune in, um, this issue is gonna come to the courts. It's, they, there will be no way to evade it. They're gonna have to deal with the pro, they're gonna have to deal with the um, <clears throat> uh, pro approval cases and they're gonna have to deal with this case. And <clears throat> uh, it's gonna be more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment or, on what Kathy said about this middle ground of saying, well, what does the agency have to say about it? And I'll tell you why we plaintiffs would never suggest to the judge, well, let's sit down and call the FDA in the, as a witness. 
Um, the lower rank FDA medical officials are um, very concerned about safety and you read their reports, they, you'd love to get them into evidence on your side, plaintiff's side. Um, but then there's the top regulators, um, and especially in this current administration, who there's already records of them overruling or vetoing what a scientist who was hired to be impartial, a doctor who examined the data, has said. So the agency report you're going to get is not any pure medicine about risk benefit or what the drug does, but you're going to get a political statement on, um, of course, if you had a different administration, you might want the political statement, but from the plaintiff's standpoint now, I certainly wouldn't want a, um, them interfering at all because I know exactly how they're going to go. So I don't see that as a good middle ground at all. Yeah. Um so I agree with part with you, but I emphatically reject then where you uh, end up. So um, I very carefully tried to parse out, but in a sort of series of law review articles, the difference between an interpretive statement by the FDA versus evidence from the regulatory record. So for example, I mean, I, I won't go on too much at length, but in Wyeth versus Levine, which was the failure to warn case in which uh, Ms. Levine um, brought a state uh, tort law action and the defendant manufacturer said this is preempted because the FDA approved the labeling and that's in that case it's an anti-preemption case right because the US Supreme Court um, there said no actually the defendant manufacturer could have added something to strengthen the warning and this is this regulatory change being affected they could have done so without getting any pre-approval from the FDA etc um, the FDA in that case had argued very vociferously before for the court that this, this should be preemption and that was their view. And my agency reference model wouldn't have embraced that because it asks for courts to give scrutiny to the underlying, is this just an interpretive view? Where is this coming from? So in that instance, it's actually fascinating if you look at the regulatory record because the FDA had a regulation on the content of drug labels that if you're an administrative law maven, uh, you might be interested, but I want to convince you even if you're not, you should be interested that when the FDA has such things, they put something out for notice and comment to the public. In the preamble to their rule, they said this won't preempt state tort law. So everyone, they got comments, they figured out this rule, blah, blah, blah. When it came back and they did the final rule, they switched 180 degrees. The administration had changed. There's all sorts of things going on. The US Supreme Court said, no, no, no. We're not going to give any kind of deference to that. That's just a switch of political view. But it's very different, in my mind, as to whether or not in that particular instance, had the FDA looked and studied, had these medical examiners had any evidence? Is it in the regulatory record? That's what I want the courts to be looking at. And now step back and think, in Wyeth versus Levine, how crazy is it that the majority in the dissent seem to actually agree that if the FDA had vigorously looked at the risks of Phenergan, which was the drug here, and what was going on, um, they might come to the same conclusion on preemption. The majority says the FDA gave no more than passing attention to this issue. And the dissent says they vigorously looked at this over 50 years. And if you look at why they can say that at the US Supreme Court, at the litigation level, no one talked about what was in that 50-year sure, regulatory sure. record. So you're right, they're dangers. That's why I don't want the FDA deference model but I just disagree that there can't be important um, pieces of information that are actually supported by the regulatory record, namely in this long history of what the FDA was looking at and what's in the record, how should that inform the question? Uh, I, Catherine, I, yeah. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the cases of dealing with the antidepressants, you know, it seems to me as a layman reading these cases that the FDA really did pay very heavy attention to it, yet, you know, the, yet the courts are letting these cases go and go to trial. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, it, that's an interesting question. I think that, um, uh, I, I believe, I've talked to various um, attorneys, but I'm, um, I'm a just dabbler in that area. There is no question that Wyeth versus Levine was not the case that they wanted before oh, the yeah, U.S. Supreme sure. Court. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. wanted Colachico. They wanted one of the SSRI cases. Now, now Mueller told me okay. at the time, he said this was just the worst case to take Okay, up. so why is that? Well, of course, the SSRI cases are sort of a death death on each side of the risk utility, right? These are people who, absent medication, 
might lead to, may, might be committing suicide, and then the risk is, is giving this medication, inducing them to commit suicide. Correct. Whereas in Wyeth, it's Phenergan, it's an anti-nausea medication for serious migraine headaches. I'm not discounting that, but it was kind of like, you know, you have that on one side, and then you have the amputation of an arm of the woman, who, by the way, was a professional guitar player. So it was like, for plaintiffs, right, that seemed like a good case to, be, to get. Now, in those cases, I believe that, there, that the courts could scrutinize more particular evidence. Of course, they're going to be competing empirical studies that will come in during the notice and comment, et cetera. But evidence that sort of overwarning in that area might cause more harm than good. I mean, there's some very, very good studies on that. And on that basis, yeah, I do think that they could, had the FDA looked at that issue, then preempt an additional failure to warn claim. I, I have. I have, an, I have a question to you, which I've been thinking about, but then your remarks just made me think I wasn't off base. And I wonder how Anita uh, thinks about this in terms of the judicial reception of Section 6C. My own, when I teach this, I feel like um, the evolution of sec Section 6C, how we would know whether the courts would be warmly towards it, embrace it or not, that evolution was entirely stunted by the rise of preemption, right? There's no need in these courts, particularly Yates, for example, that are saying, absolutely not, it's all gone. They don't have to think hard about what the underlying state tort absolutely. law should be. I don't agree with that approach. I think preemption should make courts think hard about state law and think hard about federal law and how they intersect, but I think that's why I think this, the deck is somewhat stacked against you because of the wide embrace of preemption. That sounds right to me, and uh, I, I think that it's, it's an insightful way to look at the negative judicial reception. I worry about a, a possible negative feedback loop where, loop where courts do less uh, analysis of, of, of drug design, feel less competent or bored by it even, and then um, s submit more to the uh, and overread preemption negativity uh, from uh, the Supreme Court in particular. I had a question also, uh, as Aaron did, about what you said. I was interested in your the remark you made in passing uh, that uh, the, the FDA, if you ask the agency, would, would, you, would you want your um, uh, uh, views uh, to, to preempt tort litigation, they would not always say yes, I'm assuming a political uh, ideal state that we may not uh, be in. And I, I wonder whether you think this agency is competent to have an opinion on preemption. Do they know anything in particular about whether uh, state tort decisional law would be bad or good? Do they have um, their finger on any pulse? Or, or are they just a scientific agency that can figure out whether a, a drug design is good enough to be approved? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think so. For example, I don't think they're really competent, although some courts have deferred to them in terms of a view like, we don't like tort law, right? We just don't like it. We're regulators. We like that. That shouldn't get any kind of deference. I think they are good, and Aaron was starting to ask me along these lines. If the issue is, so in um, Wyeth versus Levine, if we just go very, very specific as to what I would have liked to have seen from the regulatory record, and I read everything that there was in the whole litigation of that issue, and it was piecemeal portions of this regulatory record. So what was at issue there was the danger of overwarning. So it would be really interesting to look at empirical evidence about how many times the manufacturers had attempted to add or strengthen a warning, and the FDA had said, no, don't do that. It would create all of these kinds of problems, and in the SSRI context, the FDA might have good reason to think that it would, and then they would have a view on that. In this re whole regulatory effort, uh, the only thing that was in there was some, um, the, a few senators, congresspersons had asked the FDA how many times has a manufacturer asked through this CBE process and you said no, don't overwarn. There were like one case and it wasn't because they were worried about overwarning, they were worried that it wasn't strong enough, right? So there's a way in which what I don't want is for the agency just to say willy-nilly there's a problem. But there are certain regulatory instances where the FDA has been called upon to look, for example, very precisely at the risk utility and has looked at the evidence and is fearful, for example, that if you add a particular warning, they wouldn't want that that would create more problems. And I don't see why state courts should just give that kind of the back of the hand. So um, it gets into a little bit about um, 
about what kind of deference you give to the FDA, and I'm not arguing for Chevron mandatory deference to their position on preemption. If you're asking about does the F, you know, we often think the agencies, because they wouldn't want to enlarge their turf, would always say preempt, preempt, preempt. I did a, um, a study of this looking at US Supreme Court pro products liability cases, and it's not true. In fact, some people were arguing before that the FDA was too much always coming and saying, you know what, we do something different. Not our problem, we approve something, but tort law should decide if it's safe or not. You might worry there that they're like underappreciating their responsibility in terms of looking at risk utility of products um, Etc. So um, it's an it's an interesting question. It's why it has to be done. I think with courts looking to what's in the regulatory record and not just giving credence to political statements, it does um, further engage the people within the agency that are um, safety and design experts, not the political appointees. Last little footnote I'll say because I was I've been so interested in this issue. I did a study for the. Um, for, for um, a um, governmental body called ACUS, the Administrative Conference of the United States. So under their purview, I went in and talked to agency officials, including at the FDA, NHTSA, EPA, Consumer Product Safety Commission. It was fascinating meeting people, for example, within the FDA who had worked there uh, throughout all different political administrations who had seen preemption rise and fall in the Supreme Court to understand their views, which were, if we've looked very exhaustively at a particular uh, risk utility balance, why should that just be handed over to a jury to re-examine, and yet also fear that times when they hadn't, a political person in the general counsel's office might go out and just say, we don't like tort law. So I'm on both sides of that. Uh, that's why I don't think preemption should be just sort of a dirty word, right? It's getting the right administrative law tort balance. I just want to ask one question. Uh, I found Anita's um, presentation both descriptive of how I understood. I, I liked 6C and I defended it in writing. Um, but Anita, you know, makes some good points. And Aaron, I'm, I want to push you on your response to it. So, you know, Anita, the way she's framing her critique there is that there's a foreseeable risk of misuse. And in the ordinary risk utility test, uh, the duty to design accounts for the foreseeable risk of misuse. And uh, so, for example, one form of misuse is not following product warnings. And so as a result, the mere fact that there's an adequate product warning doesn't foreclose the claim of defective design. All black letter, up the middle stuff, right? So interestingly, she makes a pretty strong case about foreseeable misuse uh, as being part of the risk utility test. That's really the argument there, and that, that, that what 6C does is it knocks foreseeable misuse out of the risk utility test altogether. That's essentially what it does. In your response, which I'm not necessarily disagreeing with it, but I think it, it's not on its face sufficient, um, is to say, well, the problem with that is is that we're gonna take a valuable, we're gonna take the drug away from those who don't misuse it and really need it. Uh, so somehow we're fa we need to favor those who use it properly over those who misuse it, is, is really the form of argument. And that may be correct at the end of the day, but of course that same argument could be applied across the board. Um, why are drugs special in this respect? Why is it true that those who carefully use a product uh, need to be forced to use a redesigned product in order to protect those who misuse it. I mean, we have this conflict between careful users and misusers across the board. Every other product, we you know, decide that if the misuse is sufficient, we're gonna redesign accordingly. And yet here, you know, suddenly those who uh, misuse don't count in the calculus in the same way they did. Now, again, there may be a distinction, but just simply to say it's not quite right to disadvantage well, those who benefit from the drug. Yeah. There, are, there are several answers. Number one, um, um, we do have some confidence in Leonard intermediaries. Maybe not, maybe too much, but we have a considerable amount of confidence in learned intermediaries. Uh, there is, you know, if you take, let's take the classic vaporizer case, uh, the, the old vaporizer, which, which was tip, uh, could tip and the kid got off to, to go to the bathroom at, at 2 o'clock in the morning and, and, and hit the cord and boiling hot water came out. 
um, <clears throat> there we <clears throat> there were there may be people who um, who use that that vaporizer safely. On the other hand, I got I got to protect because I I don't have an intermediary to deal with. Uh, here we do. Um, it may be faulty, but we do. Secondly, the stakes are different. Um, um, if I need a drug, it's it's not because it's a luxury item. It's you know it's um, uh, I I need the drug for my health, and and it's and it's a good drug for my health, um, and and. I really get impatient when someone says, well, you know there are those, there are those people out there who are going to abuse the drug. I said, you know, I need the drug for my health. I'm using it well. And, and you know, it's not third, third party effects, it's, it's me. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I've been prescribed the drug. <clears throat> um, uh, there's a, uh, Denuvia has come, uh, is a drug which has been um, under attack. My doctor gives me Denuvia and he will not veer from Denuvia because it, it's had n n such positive effects over, over the years. I would be, yeah, I'd be really put out by the fact that somebody, that, 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 that there are folks who misuse the drug or there are doctors who, who misprescribe the drug. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different kind of calculus. So, you know, I understand, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the misuse in doctor, and I'm sympathetic to the, to the fact that there's going to be, um, that there's going to be, uh, there are going to be users who are going to misuse it, and there are going to be doctors who aren't, who are, who aren't paying attention to it, uh, and they're misprescribing their drug. On the other hand, um, um, I really don't want, that to be the um, the deciding factor as to whether or not that drug is available, whether that drug is available on the market. And I'd like to go back. There was a, two cases I didn't have time to cover that um, that show the courts are um, skeptical of the impossibility defense that you've heard about both appellate decisions. Um, and one is the uh, Genuvia product that, uh, that Aaron just made reference to. Those are called incretins. And we had the incretin litigation causing pancreatic cancer in, the, um, in San Diego in, in the uh, Ninth Circuit. And um, the judge dismissed the entire litigation, every case. He said that the, he was convinced that the FDA would have not allowed a warning of that pancreatic cancer could occur. And he did that by uh, not having any direct evidence, but trying to read some petitions and different things the defendant brought to his attention. <clears throat> Two years of appeal, eventually the Ninth Circuit just reversed it a couple months ago and said no, the, the judge should have looked more at the evidence and sent it back uh, for the trial judge. Who, this is an MDL judge, so he's seeing thousands, he's affecting thousands of cases. He, the judge might come back with the same rule again, but the impossibility defense is not something you just want to throw around. And is you, that a warning case? Yes. That's a warning case. I got no problem with warning cases. Yeah. Well, that's the warning to you. You better watch out for pancreatic cancer. <laughs> <laughs> However, I have a retainer right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, more uh, dramatic is the Fosamax litigation that mm -hmm. was. Um, a, a district judge in New Jersey had thousands of cases before him uh, relating to people who had atypical hip fractures. I won't go all into the facts. And he, this judge, too, uh, granted summary judgment on all the cases before him, saying the FDA would have not have allowed the warning that the plaintiffs we were pushing that this atypical hip fracture could occur. And there again, the judge did it not on any direct statement that the FDA said. Um, we have been requested by the defendant, the manufacturer, to add this warning, and we say no. We tell him, he just inferred that. And then again, after a long, long set of briefing and everything, the Third Circuit, again in this last the fall, said no. Uh, the judge didn't have enough basis to grant summary judgment on the impossibility defense. And the 
possibility of defenses, uh, demanding defenses, the Supreme Court said, and then again sent it back to the district judge. This has outraged defense attorneys and their amicus friends, and so they're seeking uh, certiorari, which they may well get, which uh, in the FASMAX may decide things, but at least there again, from the plaintiff's standpoint, I think judges got to be pretty cautious in jumping to an impossibility, accepting impossibility defenses when they really don't have any direct evidence from the FDA that they uh, have refused or would necessarily refuse the additional warning that was being given. But you're right, it's not a design case. But just one quick um, you know, point, actually, Aaron, I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on this. Is um, You said you have no problem with the failure to warn, but on the design defect, like, so let's think about Yates, right, where the court says this is impossibility preemption on the design. Interestingly, the state law would have said that part of the design defect case is you could have added a warning. And in Yates, they don't get into that in the impossibility context because the court, as a matter of state common law, had decided the warning was adequate. But it kind of opens up a really yeah, interesting yeah. area where, assuming failure to warn gets brought into the design defect, you're going to allow for, would be, you know, it'd be impossible to have impossibility preemption. <laughs> It, it just wasn't determined in years. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, one other just quick comment, and I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this, is another way, and this is at, at issue in the Gustavson, I agree there are peculiarities, because it's about, one could think it's about design, design of a medical device, but it's been treated as a drug mm, design right. case. And um, the FDA, I'm not sure how the FDA would think about whether changing the size of the dropper is a moderate, major, uh, change and it might be a neutral issue on which it's not poli politically inflected. The parties are trying to argue, the plaintiff side is trying to argue, not only should we look at the guidance, but we should be able to bring into court um, evidence of how the FDA has acted. So they have all sorts of evidence really? about yep. changes that the FDA seem to have uh, seem to have let go without going through any kind of pre-approval. Yep. I think that's an interesting to be litigated issue. Right, too. right. I wouldn't is mind getting involved with that. Yeah. <laughs> There's, to me, there's a difference whether you're talking about a physical injury, and primarily here, this is a consumer class action type of claim that um, you're you're wasting my money or Medicaid's Medicare's money by uh, over medicating. Um, I think we have some time now for questions from the audience. There's someone out there who has a microphone. Um, If I can, while the microphone's being passed around, I just wanted to say a couple of things in response uh, to, uh, to Mark and Aaron. I'm a little uncomfortable, Mark, with misuse, even though, I, of course, you're right to call my critique being a, about that. But to me, a misuse connotes a kind of one-off deviation, like a perverse or goofy uh, plaintiff doing something uh, stupid and harming himself. Uh, I have in mind something more systemic, a consistent pattern of, of mischaracter, of misunderstanding of what drugs are or getting them when you shouldn't have them. Um, Aaron um, attributes my, or describes my conclusion as being about favoring a flat out risk utility test. And again, I, I would quibble a little bit with that uh, characterization. At first, I don't, I don't know what flat out means. I almost feel you're, I almost, I almost hear you say that uh, you mean something that has no content at all. No, no, it would basically be a jury uh, gut um, kind of judgment about who should win. And I have in mind uh, your very rigorous idea of risk utility that would demand a lot of of plaintiffs and would not necessarily just send all injured people uh, to 12, um, I, I don't know, compassionate or um, ir irrational uh, deciders. I'd be very happy uh, with um, taking plaintiff responsibility into account and in most states uh, when the plaintiff's uh, causal contribution to her injury uh, is greater than that of, of a defendant, she'll lose utterly so that will, I think, um, comfort you some. Uh, and I would also be happy to have some variation on learned intermediary when the true source of the blame really is, uh, I don't want to go into the dreaded imputed contributory negligence or pumping it out of uh, responsibility to third parties, but if the, the reason the plaintiff suffered an injury uh, was more uh, the bad choice of the physician prescribing, I, I would be um, happy, desirous of seeing some recognition of the greater um, obligation or responsibility of that other uh, possible actor. So I think I feel, uh, now that we're ready for microphones, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. I don't know if it's working. Is it working? One second. I don't know if the Sharpie uh, opened up. 
Professor Sharkey was suggesting that we take depositions of the FDA employees. No, I was not. But I because you're not allowed. Yeah, to. no, I was yeah. not suggesting that. No. So in the, I mean, do you want? So no, I was hard. not. I didn't respond. It's very hard to uh, produce any evidence as to what the FDA did or didn't do or should have done. Yeah. So this. And the yeah. Courts don't allow it. Yeah. So in this study that I did like a decade ago, looking at state and federal courts, what was really interesting is that. Um, the federal courts were more likely to call for the views of the FDA, namely to ask them to intervene uh, as amicus. There are some in the, in the um, health labeling context. There's a whole spate of cases where the courts are using primary jurisdiction to ask the FDA about things in, in that context. That's one way. Interestingly, the FDA can intervene on its own accord as well. Uh, in cases, and they did, um, again, there was a, a per particular person in the FDA's general counsel's office, I think, who was a fan of intervening in such cases, so I'm not suggesting uh, taking depositions. I am suggesting, so it's not just through amicus briefs or primary jurisdiction, that's if the issue is sort of uncertain and we don't know what has happened. In many of these instances, there are detailed federal regulations and guidance, so it turns out, unbeknownst to some trial litigators who are litigating these issues that when it comes to like the closed container situation, there are very detailed guidelines, regulations, and guidance by the FDA, et cetera. So that can come in as part of the regulatory record. There's lots that's publicly available in the federal register of what the agency has looked at, et cetera, et cetera. So no, I'm not suggesting uh, calling for the depositions. I'm suggesting an awareness. So if you're on the plaintiff side, you're thinking about framing a particular um, claim about something like the size of the dropper, how the drug is designed, etc. You should be aware of, informed by whatever the FDA has done in that area, which is regulations, guidance, etc. There's some areas where there's not a lot, and it's this open question, and I think those are areas where the courts, if it's going to impact their preemption decision, they should think about kind of certifying the question, and there are means to the FDA to do so. That's what I was thinking about. Yes, sir. Uh, two points. First, I read the panelist CVs, but I just, for the uh, record, uh -uh. just for the record, I'd like to know, uh, for disclosure, have any of you worked for a drug company, received money from a drug company, <laughs> advised a drug company, or anything of the sort? Well, okay, next question. None? <laughs> no, well. I'm sorry, none? Have I? Uh, I'm, on occasion, I think I, would, I have to go back, and I think I've written some, I've written some briefs. Uh, but I've written briefs on the plaintiff side and on the defense side, so. Uh, secondly, and last, uh, you, the panelists have spoken of past and present. Given the current administration in Washington, D.C., where some observers see a move uh, to regulatory laissez-faire attitude, do any of the panelists wish to uh, append their remarks as to what they see might occur with a laissez-faire attitude on the regulatory agency's part? So in my own view, right, regardless of political administration, regardless of ch changes over time, um, uh, let's put it this way. If um, one of the points that I was trying to make, uh, and interestingly, actually, Aaron, when you were saying what's different about drugs, the only player you left out, you said learned intermediaries, the stakes, you left out, I think you would mm -hmm. say, and the yeah, FDA yeah, does this ex ante, it's the agency that does the most stringent ex ante regulation before product can come to market, by far, right? It does, the Consumer Product Safety Commission was uh, is it sort of about voluntary recalls of things, et cetera, et cetera. So if it were the case that the stringency of the ex-ante regulator went like this and was not doing risk-risk analysis of particular risks, then my own view is that we should see preemption go like this, and there will be more room for the expansion of state tort liability, right? Because it's exactly the question. Now, will that happen when we see regulatory lazy fare? Are we going to see that we move to, you can just come out on the market like you can with most products and then allow tort liability to take care of that? Do I think that's a good normative world to live in? No, right? I have, I have some confidence that we probably do need some, an agency doing pre-market regulatory 
uh, clearance. It could be, though, that an administration would decide we do so much ex-ante regulation, but not enough post-market surveillance, right? One could critique the FDA, even under a very liberal administration, that they weren't doing enough post-market surveillance. Maybe that could substitute for the regulation we have through tort law. So it's an interest. I personally think, yes, you have to think of the two together, and where are they complementary, and where are they substitutes. Yes. Okay. A full disclosure to the gentleman in the back. I did represent a pharmaceutical company. Um, Can't hear you. Case, I did represent a pharmaceutical company in a case not involving tort liability but off label promotion. And that leads me to the question um, for Professor Bernstein. Um, I loved your presentation. I would like to be a fly on the wall between you and uh, Professor Torsky on battling out those issues. But on just on the question of uh, off-label promotion being a reason for not a, uh, adopting the restatement third, I when I look at that, I look at, at the the problem of off-label promotion as not being necessarily a reason for not adopting the restatement third, but being something that we need to explore in more detail. Because in fact, a number of those cases uh, were all those settled cases or. All one of my data set are, are settled. Yeah. Settled cases, which is interesting because um, those cases are very expensive to litigate. And interestingly, a number of them, and I don't know if all of them because I haven't done any research on this, but were brought by whistleblowers, not by aggrieved plaintiffs who were injured by the product. They're brought by whistleblowers who spotted a potential claim that could make a lot of money, and then the, um, the, the government piggybacked on them. Um, and uh, there are some private plaintiffs who made a ton of money, and then we could go off about that. But in off-label promotion, you have a lot of drugs being used for very good uses by doctors that were never approved by the FDA. I mean, I can think of numbers of drugs. One, one particular drug comes to mind that was approved for depression, but it turned out to be never really very effective for depression, but doctors ended up using it for sleep. Um, but it's never ever approved for sleep. And so we have a problem because the drug is not being formally tested in the way that it would before the FDA. But if it's an effective drug, do we want to prevent doctors from using it that way? Um, and I guess I would probably come down to, but I'd still want to do more uh, on the side of there's a learned in the intermediary there who is making this judgment. But I wondered your thoughts on it. Uh, that, that's very interesting. Uh, thank you. I did not mean, uh, and I, I'd like to clarify wh what I did mean. Uh, I, I did not mean to say that, uh, that I regarded uh, off-label uh, prescribing a, as a bad thing, nor did, did I intend to credit necessarily the true horror and magnitude of, of all those recitations of multi-million dollar um, uh, uh, settlements and, uh, and criminal penalties as well. Rather, uh, just to touch on your last point, Nina, what you were saying uh, at, at the end, I, I think the premises of 6C may be unsound. And uh, in particular, I don't think uh, that the idea that uh, a small number of very needy, very deserving uh, uh, people who cannot be helped by anything else will forfeit the uh, availability of a drug altogether um, if um, plaintiff's lawyers can take it down uh, by complaining about its, um, uh, its, its design defects under a risk utility test. So I'm, I'm just sort of uh, poking at uh, the, the, the facts or, or the empirics behind the, uh, the structure, the architecture of, of 6C and saying if the, the premises are unsound, uh, maybe the standard needs to be uh, rethought. And so I, I hope uh, that this more moderate, possibly more moderate characterization uh, of my remarks unites with what you're saying because I, I, I do not mean to fault uh, the, uh, the drug behaviors, the drug company behaviors you advert to. Well, you know, yes. Louder, please. Wait, wait I had a question. she's bringing in the microphone. I had a question for Professor Sharkey. Um, so you, uh, expressed a preference for uh, implied preemption and, and perhaps justifiably because I'm wondering what, uh, how to situate in your framework uh, savings clauses to express preemption. What do we make of them and how do they slot into this analysis? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, 
let me think of a succinct answer. I didn't talk, right? When I mentioned express versus implied preemption, I talked about how express means there's a, a, um, a provision that directly addresses uh, preemption. And I didn't mention that um, oftentimes, right, again, Congress, I like saying Congress in its infinite wisdom, because you can either take that at face value <laughs> or assume I don't believe in that, and maybe this depends upon different political administrations, different times. But Congress, in its infinite wisdom, I should have said, almost never, even when it passes an express preemption provision, is actually explicit or clear about what the effect of preemption would be. Why is that? Because if you look, as I have, at how these express preemption provisions are written, they say things like requirements. And then you get into this debate, is state tort law a requirement? Is it regulatory? Is it something else? They never come out and say, we're passing this particular federal regulation, and state tort law should be ousted, right? That would be a very clear preemption provision. And you're now bringing up another thing that Congress does. So for example, the Geyer case uh, looked at this in the Motor Vehicle Safety Act. They will pass an express preemption provision and a savings clause. So a savings clause sort of says, oh, we don't mean to, uh, they don't say, they say, you know, uh, tort law is saved, right, is, is still there. But then you think, wait a minute, there's an express preemption provision and a savings provision. So you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. What does this mean? So the U.S. Supreme Court, when they decided Geyer, decided that there's not express preemption, but maybe implied preemption still survives. And I think, you know, you ask a very, very interesting question. If Congress were to be very, very explicit that it does not want state tort law to be ousted, then I don't think preemption should be able to come in and say there's implied preemption. But we're always, in fact, even in express preemption world, in this nether world, because Congress doesn't specify what okay. it means. So that's, I think, what I was, um, uh, you're right to bring up that kind of question. Um, but, um, but I don't think, um, again, I should have just said Congress could, with the stroke of the pen, decide to preempt or decide not to preempt. My own particular view is there's a good reason for Congress not to say thumbs up or thumbs down, right? As you've seen through this discussion, I think it's a particular nuanced inquiry that in certain uh, realms where they have done the regulatory work, there should be preemption and other ones not. And for Congress to intuit ex ante where this would lead in yet to be discovered risks, et cetera, would not be good in either direction. And so I think on that, neither plaintiffs nor defendants would want me on board. I think this is why I can do the, you know, punching bag for both. Well, you have been a wonderful audience, and thank you for coming. Uh, if you are getting CLI credit, make sure that you sign out at the end so that you, you get the appropriate credit. And that works.